five. Good morning and welcome to the June 3rd, 2020 Board of County Commissioners meeting. I'm Kate Flavin, Public Information Officer with Sedgwick County. We are streaming this morning's meeting live on KPTS Channel 8. We're also on the county's Facebook and YouTube platforms. Uh, you'll notice we are still set up social distancing um, between commissioners. We have some plexiglass barriers, so they are at the bench this morning. Uh, this morning, before we start the meeting, I would like to invite Joan Tammany, the Executive Director of ComCare, up to the podium to give us an update. Morning, Joan. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, Joan Tammany, Executive Director of ComCare. Um, thank you for giving me a few minutes this morning. I want to talk about kind of a sobering issue. As a nation, we're all grappling with all the emotional, um, challenging situations, including the trauma of the pandemic. Um, add to that, we have isolation from staying at home. We have rising unemployment and economic challenges. We have people not seeing loved ones as they have in the past. Um, we have lots of um, stories in the news that are distressing and, and fearful. Um, boredom has set in for some. Domestic violence has increased for some. And it all leads to an, an underlying uncertainty, fear, and anxiety. Um, nationally, there's a term we're using um, in our field, and it's called a mental health tsunami. Um, we all are worrying about the expected spikes in suicide rates, the potential for overdoses, and overall psychological trauma over the next few months, and we anticipate over the next few years. So we know from history of hurricanes and other uncontrollable events that usually within two to three months after the initial crisis, psychological um, distress sets in, and it's highest right about now. So across the nation and locally, we're starting to see the impact of that, um, um, the impact of all the emotional um, issues that people are dealing with. And across our community, we're starting to see a spike in suicide rates. So I know a few weeks ago when I was asked, did we hear of any? No, we hadn't, but it's about that time and it's starting. And unfortunately, we have heard um, personally of nine deaths by suicide in the last two and a half weeks. Um, overwhelming number, all males with the exception of one under the age of 40. We're also hearing about escalating suicide attempts in our um, young adult and adolescent um, population. So I want to be here today to make note of that because it's it's very difficult on my workforce, you know, because we try our best to be there when people are in need. Um, but you know, I believe one death by suicide is one too many. So I want to make sure that we are, as a community, are recognizing that many people are struggling in this difficult time, and many are doing so in silence, and or they're turning to alcohol and drugs to cope. So um, they may see themselves as a burden to family and friends. They may not ask for help. I'm here to say today that there's no shame in being in a position of struggle. Um, there's no shame in asking for help, and there's no shame or embarrassment or worry about asking somebody directly if they're struggling with suicidal ideation. Um, I know there's a lot of mental health and substance abuse professionals in our community. ComCare is one of those. So whether you're family or friend or you're the person struggling, we encourage you to reach out. Ask for help. You don't have to go it alone. Um, uh, ask directly if somebody's struggling with self-destructive thoughts. We know a lot of people are. Even those of us that are emotionally healthy are struggling with all the news we're seeing and hearing every day. Stress levels are at an all-time high. So um, depression has many faces. Uh, we think about depression when somebody's tearful and, and, and um, depressed and, and sad um, or um, isolating all the time, but it's also, uh, it also can show itself as irritability and it, uh, constant annoyance, um, excessive worry, anxiety, um, you name it. There's a lot of faces to depression, so don't just rely on the typical symptoms you think about when somebody may be um, thinking about harming themselves. So ComCare's one provider in town that's here to help. We have a crisis center and a crisis line that's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A simple walk into our facility 
facility, um, the number is posted up on the screen, or a call to 660-7500. Um, we're here to help. We have counselors and other support people there to offer some words of hope or encouragement or help you work through that moment, um, whether you're a loved one, a friend, a family, just a concerned community member, or somebody who's struggling. So I, I, I know this. We have expected this. Um, it's devastating that it's starting, and it's starting <coughs> rapidly. Um, I want you to know that we're working with communications and community partners to start more of a, uh, an awareness communication plan around this issue. So I just here today to let you know it's starting. <clears throat> Thank you, Joan. Um, so that crisis number is 660-7500? Yep. Okay. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That, this is... Uh, Confidential, no cost. Yeah. Good. Confidential. No thank, cost. Thank you for, for, there's a few commissioners want to make some comments. But just, I can't remember who was first. It was Michael. Commissioner Cruz. Michael. Or Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you. Uh, Joan, thank you for the report today. You said there were nine suicides in the last two and a half weeks. Nine that we have heard of. Right. How many since this pandemic started? Um, I, is there a way for you to get that information? Is there a way for you to estimate that information? I know that we hadn't heard of any other until two and a half weeks ago. Well, clearly there had have been some in between two and a half weeks ago and two months ago. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we'll know at the end, when we do our analysis of autopsy reports with the Forensic Science Center at some point later <clears throat> in the year, but right now, no, we don't have that information. Okay, where did you gather the nine? Uh, people have shared that information with us. Okay. Reliable sources. So it may have been before two and a half weeks ago, some of those nine, but you just heard about it. No, we heard about them the day they occurred. Okay, and you never heard about it before in the last two months? No, we haven't had any requests for records. None of uh, none of these are known to us. These are community members who are really struggling. Yeah. No, I, I unfortunately had been hearing stories about that as well, mm -hmm. about the despair, um, emotional despair, financial despair, mm -hmm. economic despair. Um, as well as just the, the concerns about the coronavirus. So, yeah. so uh, I, hopefully at some point we can get an estimate um, from you uh, on how many you think did take their lives on this. I know nationally they're estimating, I saw a CNN report talking about maybe 75,000 people because of this. Well, it's, it, it, it's, it's a range of 26,000 to 124,000, depending on how quickly we move through this, and we know it's not going to be quick, so yeah. it's, it's, it's just it's, tragic. It's unfathomable. Horrific, mm -hmm. actually. So, thank you, Joan. Commissioner Cruz. Thank you. Um, gosh, that's sobering news. Um, so, the communication that's... Um, are we going to have, uh, Mr. Manager, are we going to have... Um, I haven't looked to see exactly what the CARES funding will be um, requested today, but I know around the country they have very, very robust suicide prevention communication strategies. And I know that you guys are working on one, but how can we help? What, what can we do to push this out quicker, bigger, I mean, reach as many people? I mean, what, what can we do? Yeah, and that's what we're meeting again on Thursday, um, tomorrow afternoon to talk about, or tomorrow at 11, I think, to talk about what options we have, knowing we might have to tap into some funds for that. So give us a few days and we're going to work on it. It just really sprung really fast and rapidly. Yeah. Well, you know, as always, Joan, I'm I'm glad to see you today, but I'm not glad to hear I your know. news. Um, and please let me know if there's anything that I can do to help. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to be in that conversation if possible. Um, and I think the Mental Health Substance Abuse Coalition is going to have to be in that mix with mm -hmm. us as a partner as well. Yep. Um, and, you know... We just obtained some grant dollars. We'll have to look and see if those grant dollars can help some of this as well. As many people and as diverse a population of people who can start talking about it visually and publicly is going to help. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay. Well, John, thanks again. I know we, we've all been um, trying to make the public aware that, that there's this uh, hidden impact. It's kind of not so hidden now. It's... Uh, yeah. I've, I've been very, really concerned about it. The, all of those words you used mm -hmm. are uh, really of concern, well, huge and concern. It, and as I stand here, don't wait to the moment when it's overwhelming. Start reaching out when you're starting to feel the emotional impact of it. Um, I know at least for ComCare, we can talk to people by phone. We can do televideo, digital, virtual visits. We can deploy our 
a mobile unit if we need to. There's lots of different ways to touch base with somebody who may be in despair. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Tom. Uh, Chairman, just to comment on Commissioner Cruz's uh, question, uh, there is nothing on the CARES uh, request list today, but we all, I've talked with all of you individually, all of you have been concerned about what we're calling the second shoot that's going to drop on this COVID pandemic. Um, we've been all busy with the virus, clearly, but the what Joan is talking about today is things that I know you have all uh, express concern about. Uh, we'll stand ready uh, when Joan or Tim uh, come to the table with uh, uh, clearly under CARES funding, it is allowable mm -hmm. to uh, to deal with this type of component of the virus. So we'll stand ready and when she comes to the table with a plan, we'll have it presented to you right away. I think I just had one other comment is we have a workforce that's struggling with the same issues the rest of the nation is struggling with and to really promote um, in your individual conversations with um, employees or your supervision with employees, self-care is really critical right now. We need to encourage people to get up and move, get some sunlight, um, open a can of soda, whatever it takes to get a moment of emotional reprieve because they're struggling too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joan. All right. And uh, one more announcement, uh, this Saturday uh, on June 6th is our first Household Hazardous Waste Remote Collection event. We will be in Garden Plain from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. What we are doing this time to ensure the safety of our staff and residents who come to participate in the event, staff will remove the materials from the vehicle so residents can stay inside the vehicle and there won't be that contact or, um, or any risk of touching each other or uh, any contact like that. Um, a list of the items that we are accepting here are on the, scr on the screen. Um, we are accepting paint, batteries, motor, motor oil, household cleaners, fertilizers. We are asking people to not bring waste generated by businesses or industries, tires, electronics, TVs. Uh, more information on these events can be found online or on the Sedgwick County social media pages. And then on the agenda this morning, commissioners, we have meeting minutes. PPE and other donations are ready to be accepted. You'll have a discussion of the CARES Act, like we just discussed. And then there's two resolutions authorizing the creation of a benefit district for Osage Country Edition. And finally, you will have a report of the Board of Bids and Contracts. So, Chairman, I will hand the meeting to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Kate. And, and thank you to the public for tuning in on KPTS and, and other social media venues we have. Um, with that, I'll call the meeting to order of Wednesday, June 3rd for the Sedgwick County Board of County Commissioners. Um, Madam Clerk, next time. Invocation to be observed by a moment of silence. Please remain standing for the flag salute. Please. Roll call. Commissioner O'Donnell? Present. Commissioner Dennis? Present. Commissioner Howell? Present. Commissioner Cruz? Present. Chairman Meitzner? Present. Next item, please. Public agenda. Commissioners, you've uh, got a copy, uh, received a copy of the uh, public comments. We received two of them. Uh, they've been printed out as well for your review. Uh, does any commissioner uh, have any comment or want to share any? Okay, being none, entertain a motion. Motion, motion to receive, receive and file. file. Thank you. Receive uh, file. Yeah. Motion to receive and file. Okay. Second. Been motion to receive and file the public <coughs> agenda. Public comments, I mean. Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. Chairman Meitzner? Aye. Madam Clerk, next item. Consideration of minutes. Item A, regular meeting minutes of May 6th to 2020. 
commissioners, if it's all right with you all, I would like to combine uh, A and B, the minutes of uh, May 6th and May 13th, if you've had a chance to read and review. Um, and if there's Ms. any Mr. comments. Chair, I uh, move that we approve the meeting minutes uh, from May 6th and May 13th, 2020. Okay. Second. There's a motion and a second to approve the minutes of both May 16th and, or May 6th and 13th. Uh, being no other comments, Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. Chairman Meitzner? Aye. Madam Clerk, next item, please. New business, item C, acceptance of donations of personal protective equipment and other materials from various citizens and community partners for COVID-19 response. Good morning, Rusty. Good morning, Commissioners. Rusty Leeds, Public Safety Manager. Um, this morning, I bring to you uh, for consideration um, a list of uh, donors who have provided protective equipment to the Emergency Operations Center uh, and Emergency Management to support all the medical and first response uh, entities in the county who have been working uh, to manage the COVID uh, situation. So the Emergency Management and the EOC logistics team have received donations of PPE and other materials from individual citizens, families, and community partners. And the materials received are distributed to our, uh, through our logistics team to all those entities that I just mentioned. Uh, with that said, in the last month, uh, the number of donations have declined as we've moved through this uh, over the past 90 days or so. Uh, but those who uh, continue to provide some support included Cayman wiping materials, provided 1,000 cloth masks, Elizabeth Conrad, uh, 14 N95 masks and two surgical masks. Pleasant Valley United Methodist provided cleaning supplies. Lamar Donuts provided six dozen donuts. Um, the Douglas County Citizens Committee on Alcoholism Incorporated provided 1,300 probe covers uh, for disposable thermometers. Kristen Brewer and Tara and Chris Kinski uh, Kristen associated with the Wichita State Criminal Justice Department. Uh, they collectively provided 162 mask clips to relieve the ears of those who wear the, the masks with the, clip, uh, the, the loops around the ears. Sunflower Healthcare provided 500 masks. United Healthcare provided hand sanitizer. And the National Council for Behavioral Health and the Association of Community Mental Health Centers of Kansas provided 1,000 masks. And then finally, uh, AAA Kansas provided 2,000 surgical masks and 200 bottles of hand sanitizer. Uh, so I would ask you to uh, acknowledge the generous donations of these individuals and businesses and uh, authorize the chairman to sign letters uh, thanking these individuals for their support. Very good, Rusty. Uh, very generous of these groups and individuals. At, um, another sign of our community coming together in a, in a positive way to try to uh, help, help battle through this. Any other uh, comments? Being none, entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. I'll second it. Is there a motion on the acceptance of the donations? Um, being no comments, Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Hell? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. Chairman Meitzner? Aye. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Item D, discussion of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Tom Stills, County Manager. And before we start on this agenda item, I, I don't know, Chairman, if you mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, but the Commission is back on the bench today, but I don't know if the TVs are picking it up very well, but there is a plexiglass separation between our Commissioners now uh, as the, the theme inside of this building is still social distancing and maintaining separation in a, in a safe and responsible manner. So I just wanted to point that out. I don't know that the, the KPTS audience can see that or not. Um, the item today, there's three components to the, uh, to the, to the CARES uh, briefing today. Two will be requests, and Lindsay will start us off with a, uh, a status of a community needs assessment um, very early on. In the management of CARES, our uh, outside consultant has recommended this type of approach to initiate the conversation with the community on needs that could potentially be funded by CARES dollars. So that tool is now completed. There is a draft in front of you, and Lindsay will step us through that today, and we seek guidance from the Commission on moving forward with this. The other two items will be asks. Uh, Rusty will present. 
uh, a ask for a couple of EMS vehicles on, using CARES money, and uh, Tim will make an ask for antibody testing using CARES money. So those are that's the lineup for today. Lindsay. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, Good morning Commissioners. Uh, so as Tom said, um, we are we are at a the next milestone related to our CARES funding. So as Tom had mentioned, um, early in this process, we knew that uh, we would be receiving funding. Um, and we also know that Sedgwick County, though, has not traditionally been in the role of grantor. And so we had reached out to our auditor, BKD, to say, can you help us? Well, of course, because they're going to audit us, they're not really in a position to help us um, a whole lot on the, on the actual management decisions. And so they gave us a recommendation to work with, work with a firm called Wit O'Brien's. And it just so happens that at about that exact same time, uh, there was a call with the National Association of Counties uh, where Wit O'Brien provided some best practices in terms of creating an allocation um, and, and awarding this money in a fair and equitable fashion. And so what the result was then is the development of a strategic plan. Unfortunately, we don't know what we don't know. And so we need to know what kind of needs are out in the community. We can guess, and we certainly know that we have needs. But in terms of trying to understand what maybe eligible costs might be out there, uh, we need to do a good job of hearing from folks. And so this is the tool that has been drafted to do that. This is not a guarantee of funding if folks submit this. It is not a guarantee that because they believe it's eligible, you will think it's eligible or our consultant will find it eligible. But what we want to do is try and put this document out. Uh, you have a handout at your seats. Um, it will be posted on the website soon. We'll talk about process uh, when we get through the document. Um, but it is roughly 10 pages and what is intended to do right now is essentially provide some boundaries and some guidelines to help people think through maybe what would be eligible and what wouldn't be eligible so that they can give us that feedback. So it's 10 pages. Um, the inside cover of the document you have um, gives you a table of contents. And so I'm just briefly going to walk through if you have questions about any of the specifics, please revert to that table of contents and it can get you where you need to go. So um, page one basically describes the background on this that the law was passed on March 27th. Um, we, of course, received our funding on April 23rd, and then it basically establishes us as the regulatory authority. So again, even if an entity may believe that they have eligible funds, that is your call as the Board of County Commissioners. So again, to try and put out there some proposals, some thoughts of very obvious needs that we know are eligible under CARES. The first category is for government assistance. Um, yesterday, the governor's uh, SPARC task force, which is the group that's overseeing their CARES funding, met. Um, they did basically do some computations that showed that Sedgwick and Johnson County were awarded approximately, um, I believe it was $194 per uh, citizen. And then, um, so they were going to award to all 103 counties um, amounts in that per capita uh, range. And then they also said that they would award some additional funding based on impact for unemployment um, or COVID impact. And so actually Sedgwick County, in addition to the 99 million we've already received, can anticipate receiving an additional $9 million in CARES Act funding uh, from the state uh, related to our high unemployment. And so that will be a separate discussion, uh, but certainly a part of this. But what we have learned from that discussion is that it is the state's intention that all 105 counties act as the pass-through entities for funding to cities in their jurisdictions. And so this program number one, government assistance, would be intended to do that. And it could be for school districts, uh, which we'll get to later in, in there, even though that's a governmental unit. Um, but this part is particularly designed for cities and then uh, potentially townships if they have eligible costs. So what you can see is the eligible applicants on, uh, this is page four. You can see eligible uses. So again, these are just some suggestions. It's a, intended again to give some boundaries um, and, and start that thought process. This is just a needs assessment. Yes, sir. Lindsay, just, this is a, a quite a document and this could be quite a presentation. Do you prefer to go through it and then us ask questions or do you want to have some dialogue back and forth? Uh, I, I love to have questions as you think of them. <laughs> 
Well, my, my first quickest is that, so the, based on the Spark meeting yesterday that I was not able to watch and attend, so that $194 per citizen is what Spark said, that they looked at what, how much money Johnson and Cedric got received divided by uh, per capita right. population. And yep. they said that, that was the model they were going to use. Yes. So does this a answer the question that I, I, I had I had reached out to the to the Topeka contacts. So there confusion about uh, were we supposed to, or are we as the county because I think Johnson County one was unclear and we were unclear. So this establishes that that we as the counties are in charge of our own cities? At, at least as char in terms of what the state expects, it does not sound like the state would intend to give cities within our county dollars. And so uh, the guidance that we have received from the Treasury says we don't have to give money away to anyone if, if you don't want to. Okay. But the expectation would be that if those cities get assistance, the state has said it would need to come from Sedgwick County, not from them. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Sure. So, um, so that's category one, um, which is, again, assistance to local governments. Uh, you can see that there are a number of things that they list for eligible cost categories, including payroll, um, adjustments to the way we've had to deliver service. Um, if folks are having to telework, costs associated with that can be reimbursed through these funds um, if the commission chooses to allow that through its strategic plan later in the process. Uh, public health initiatives, including contact tracing, are eligible. So certainly we know our Department of Health is doing that. I don't expect that maybe other um, cities in the county are doing that, but if they did, that could be an eligible expense for them. Um, there's emergency medical or alternate transportation costs, and so you'll hear some of that discussion today from the county perspective when Rusty comes to visit with you. Uh, public service initiatives, including food assistance or even potentially wellness checks. And then you can see that they have included a category for what is not eligible, and this is going to be universal across um, each of these categories, but revenue replacement is one of the key things that has been ruled out, and so that is true for the county, and it will be true for any of the other local governments governments that um, come through this process. And so um, that will be an important thing for us to emphasize. So category two then is public health assistance programs. Again, it is structured similarly to what you saw before. There are examples of what would be an eligible use of the fund as well as eligible applicants. And so you can see hospitals or clinics with a community benefit, both private and um, public. Uh, would be eligible to seek CARES funding. Again, that does not mean, and it's not a guarantee that the commission would choose to fund that. Um, but at least it would be helpful to know what needs exist in our community. Uh, certainly a number of you over the last several weeks have mentioned that maybe it would be worth, even if we can't give funding, even if something's not eligible, that we could lobby for that or use that to inform our set le state legislators or our congressional delegates um, so that maybe they could craft some assistance for those folks who maybe aren't eligible um, in whatever strategic plan you all authorize. So eligible cost categories for public health are on page six. And you can see that that includes testing or screening. Again, contact tracing if it's not done by a government. Again, this focus on public health entities themselves. Um, communication and community outreach. I think this is going to be a big one uh, based on the discussions um, today and the last few weeks about trying to get word out uh, about our programs and about how to um, protect folks from COVID-19. You can see that there's also preparation for emergency planning, um, protective measures. Now, one thing that is important to note is that the most recent guidance that was put out by Treasury last week um, does say that we cannot plan for a future uh, crisis. We cannot buy PPE for a future expected outbreak. We have to deal with the current outbreak. And so that will be a limitation um, that we will need to think through, not to say that we won't want to plan for that, um, but we may need to do that with county dollars as opposed to CARES dollars. You can see, again, in eligible cost categories, I think revenue replacement is a, a big one for that. And yes, sir. Right. Commissioner Cruz. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. So just so we're clear for the folks that are watching, so anything like anything, any costs that were occurred for the eligible 
between March 1st. So any, I mean, if they've been saving receipts and have things that are on this list, they can, they can talk about that. They can send that in. Right. So we want to know what the need is. And then based on what they tell us that need is, um, there are some forms and we'll talk about those and what they contain, but we want to know kind of what the scope is because we can then use that to craft a recommended strategic plan for you that will include how many dollars we need to set aside for that particular purpose. And so um, this is all done on a reimbursement basis for now. Mm -hmm. And so that means it would look back to March 1st through the current date. That doesn't mean that if, a, if we get another outbreak in two weeks, that folks wouldn't be able to submit uh, reimbursement requests for dealing with that particular issue at that time. It's just we can't stock up in anticipation of another outbreak. Well, if that you makes say sense. future needs, but I mean, March 1st is already gone. Yes. So, I mean, if people have, you know, put these up or, you know, done all of these, they've been incurred all of these expenses <laughs> starting at March 1st, would those expenses be eligible? They, they definitely could be. They are okay. eligible under the CARES Act. What will be up to you all is to say in your strategic plan for allocating those funds is if that's something you will allow them to seek reimbursement for from the county. But yes, we absolutely want them to keep their receipts. Right now, depending on their status, they may be able to go to FEMA and get 75% um, reimbursement for that PPE. They may not have to wait for us. Um, so there are a couple of opportunities for folks to, to buy these kinds of things and get some funds today. But yes, if they have not already received other monies, then they are eligible to come and ask for our dollars. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. So uh, moving into category uh, three, social services assistance. Um, this is one that basically talks about support services throughout Sedgwick County. And so it suggests eligible applicants, but you'll see that it's fairly broad. And so that does allow um, pretty much anyone who believes that they fit this category and who believe that they have eligible needs to tell us about that. Again, it will depend on what you include in your strategic plan as to whether those are reimbursed. You can see that it includes uh, social support initiatives, costs for expanding existing services beyond what they were doing before the pandemic. Again, all of these are prefaced on the fact that it can't be something that was already included in their 2020 budget. It includes food assistance programs, workforce development for displaced workers as a result of COVID-19, so we would need to demonstrate that. Crisis counseling counseling mental health support initiatives, which I know already came up this morning. Um, again, if there were folks who needed to enroll to get government assistance and maybe a not-for-profit was assisting them with that process, then that not-for-profit would maybe have some eligible expenses. The protective measures that Commissioner Cruz just referenced would be categories of funding that could uh, be sought reimbursement for. And again, costs associated with modifying the delivery of services. So if they're delivering services remotely or in a different way and they had to buy uh, stuff to support that, they would be able to come and seek that reimbursement. Um, again, the same type of ineligible cost categories are listed on page eight for that category. Number four is the educational assistance program. Again, based on clarification uh, that was provided yesterday through that SPARC task force, we now know that school districts uh, will be eligible to come and ask for funding. This isn't necessarily tailored for higher education because higher education um, is a state supported system, but certainly uh, colleges, universities, community colleges are welcome to tell us what their needs are again, because even if we can't give them funding from our pot, uh, there would potentially be an opportunity for you to pass that along uh, to our other representatives who may be in a position to give us some funding. You can see the eligible costs on page nine, um, up to and including facility security, PPE, leases if they needed a short-term lease to provide additional space um, or service, uh, and then costs associated with modifying the method of teaching. So distance learning costs and technology to do that. Now, one thing that is interesting is that the guidance that came out from the U.S. Treasury last week did say, you know, maybe rural broadband is something that has come up about trying to provide that service. They have said, if that cannot be completed within the time frame that we've been given for CARES, then it is not an eligible expense. So it must be completed by December 30th. And given where we are with our timing structure, I'm, I'm not really uh, confident that that could be done, but I, I fully expect that that would be a question that would come up. Um, and so Commissioner O'Donnell, you had asked uh, at the budget workshop 
last Thursday about what maybe we needed to convey um, to our congressional delegation, that might be something that would uh, be an example of that. So then category five is kind of our catch-all category. It is if we don't, we haven't necessarily thought of a clear use um, of the CARES funding, um, this gives folks the boundaries, again, kind of the guidelines that they need to use, and they will be able to submit uh, their needs assessment to us. So um, with that, I'm, I am prepared to move to the process discussion about how we're going to get this in next steps, but are there any questions I can answer for you all before we do that? Well, I'll, I'll defer to the uh, fellow commissioners on the specifics, but it, it does clear up the thing about <clears throat> We support the cities. Uh, we've always been um, questioning: Are we supposed to? You know, what, what's our involvement with school districts? It looks like that's been answered. So there's a few large, large questions that have been answered. Um, <clears throat> my briefest comment related to school districts is: I've heard from some, I feel like valued uh, uh, people that that it's really important from my perspective that the kids at, at the smallest K-1 to what other, to go back to school to start learning and seeing and being around. And maybe uh, my if I had a choice to say, can we test every, every child the week before they go? Uh, so we know as a community and the schools know, but that would be one, that'd be a pretty large task, but, uh, but it would in, <clears throat> help ensure that children and, uh, junior high and high school and everybody get back to some kind of normalness, especially since children are not being, they're not in the class of, of group, of age groups that are, that have the symptoms, so they might be carrying it, they just don't know. So, so anyway, just one of my first comments, Commissioner Howe. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm curious. We, there was some dis some discussion about business interruption grants. Where does that fit into these? That categories? would be that other category. Um, because it is it is hard to know what that would look like, and there are a number of other opportunities for private businesses to seek funding. And so it's more about trying to understand maybe what needs they have uh, that would be different than what those um, existing funding sources already do. I also would say that in the discussion yesterday with that SPARC task force, um, they have talked about three rounds of funding. Round one of funding is what we just talked about, which is sharing money with local governments. Round two, though, is going to be... Um, the and inner, I'm sorry, revitalizing the economy. And so strategic investments for short term and then creating lasting long term opportunities for growth. And so they have put together uh, quite a savvy group of steering committee members. Um, and so basically, at, in that discussion yesterday, they said that would be the place where those committee members would really um, have the opportunity to contribute and say kind of what that revitalizing the economy looks like. So I think there's there's lots of discussion about that, possibly even from other funding sources. I, I think that there's probably likely to get, likely going to be countywide um, efforts on on behalf of, uh, on behalf of Sedgwick County that will benefit all Sedgwick County residents, and because of that, uh, a good chunk of this uh, nearly um, good 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 chunk of the cares funds, I think, will be retained and used essentially by Sidra County, I, I believe. But um, I do think it'd be interesting for us to kind of speculate or estimate how much money would be available to the business and, and how much would be available to community uh, or to our, our cities. Uh, I would like to just know if we could earmark for a short time a little bit of money simply saying that if you're a city within Sidra County, that rather than trying to rush to get your, your requests in, um, that we would give them a certain amount of time to say, if you have eligible expenses, this is essentially money we think that probably probably deserves to the, belongs to the city, as long as you have eligible expenses that would that would fit the CARES uh, paradigm. So I, I would like to encourage us to, to consider maybe, you know, set aside, if you will, certain funds anticipating those requests for time. Maybe there ought to be a time that says, We've, we passed a certain date, so now we're going to re all those monies that are left over would revert, revert back, if you will, to the larger pot. But I think for a time, we've got to consider maybe allocating, if you will, or earmarking money for certain cities, our, our cities to give them a chance to develop their requests, because I think there's going to be a, a lot of pressure on them to hurry up, and I don't know if we want to do that. So, 
So I don't know that I could necessarily speculate about how much we would want to set aside. I think that'll be part of our strategic plan process. But one of the considerations we could certainly use is what the state has done and basically look at a per capita basis and try and assign that maybe a reserve based on that. Um, and so um, I think that is, if I recall correctly, the state said they had looked at a maximum of 45% of their allocation to be passed along to the smaller governments um, and even to Sedgwick and Johnson counties for that unemployment or that COVID rate. And so we could look at a similar funding model um, and we could talk about that with our consultant to see maybe what other folks are doing. That is one thing they're doing for us now is aggregating all of that information um, so that we can come and report and give you some comfort that what we're doing is consistent with what other governments are doing. I think that'd be a good idea, and um, again, it would not be for, you know, from, from now through December, I would say maybe 60 days or so, um, maybe 90 days, we would give them opportunity to to respond and essentially say, it, providing there's eligible expenses that you come up with, that we would, we would anticipate that this is money that would be available to you if that's what, if that's what you do, but if you don't, there's a point where you would, you would essentially have to give that up, and so I think there's a way for us to, to do that, but Certainly not $104 per citizen. That, that doesn't work. It's going to be something, you said 45%. I don't right. know if that's the right number. Maybe maybe that's too high. I don't know what it would be. But we ought to, I think we ought to have that strategy to, to, to just to let our cities know we are on their side and uh, they're our partners. And we'd like to encourage them to take their time and figure that, figure this out. Okay. I'm happy to take that feedback Thank back you. to our consultant. I will just comment as well, add to that. that <clears throat> uh, I'll communicate as well and manage it with our federal lobbyists because I know there's rumors that they may be having another round of some kind of a, of a revenue replacement uh, nationwide uh, plan. I understand it's not near as big as what they've been doing, but uh, but there is that discussion, so we probably ought to keep uh, let our uh, lobbyists know what we're doing there. Okay, sir. To keep. Okay, so with that, maybe can I move into the process discussion? Or are there other specific questions about the NOFO I can cover? Which that is the lingo, by the way, NOFO, Notice of Funding Opportunity. So that's what all the cool kids Notice are saying. Notice of Funding Opportunity. Yes. I've learned a lot in the last few weeks. Always, we must have acronyms for everything. Yes, acronyms. We are government. Acronyms. We're good at acronyms. There's a motion to have an acronym. <laughs> Okay. All right. With that, I'm going to pick right back up. So um, process. How are we going to get this information? We have this great document. What's next? If you all approve this today as is, then what we would do is continue to work with our webmaster to get these forms put out on our website. So what would happen is there would be a, a banner added um, to the front of the county's page. Uh, we would have a link included on the COVID-19 resource page. Folks would go there and they would basically have pathways to follow um, that follow these five categories here. And so then it would take them to an online form where they would be able to answer a whole lot of questions to help us understand what their need is, how it is associated with COVID-19, and how much. And so those forms would then be put out on the website and made available um, hopefully by Friday. We would work with communications. Um, they're already working with our consultant. I believe they have a meeting today to talk about uh, the news release that would go out um, to our normal listservs and distribution chains um, to let folks know that it's available. People would have two weeks to respond to that. We would also have a designated email address, Sedgwick Cares at sedgwick.gov that would um, allow folks to send us questions about whether what they're asking for is eligible or to ask how to make things available or maybe they don't have internet um, easily accessible and so they want hard copies of forms uh, so that we can work with people to make sure that this is getting out. Um, Tanya also has graciously, Tanya Cole has graciously offered to allow us to work with um, the interpreter that she's using on the communications plan, uh, the larger communications plan in case there's a need for that as well so that we can really make sure we're hitting every uh, possible category of folks who may need or be eligible for the funding here in the county. So again, they would have two weeks to do that. Um, on a call with our consultant this morning, we believe that, that they need basically a week 
um, to analyze that data because their intention would be to collect that data on an ongoing basis to help us put together the categories that then we could use to put together a recommended strategic plan for you that would identify dollars, um, reserves, everything, knowing that this money needs to last us at least through December 30th. And certainly we've already heard discussion about extending that time frame um, if a second wave hits. So we want to be very deliberate um, and cautious in how we allocate those dollars. So we hopefully would have something to bring to you around the July 4th holiday that could roll out to the community saying, here is how you apply for funding. And then that, of course, would go through the group that Brent Shelton is chairing, and he'll give you an update on, on the status of that group here in a moment. So um, I did also just want to briefly follow up uh, Johnson County. Uh, we have been in, in, I would say, almost daily conversations with their team up there uh, talking about their process. And I would tell you, the finance director there has authorized me to share with you that we are just one step ahead, though generally we're in sync. And so uh, we have a call scheduled with them first thing tomorrow morning, kind of their core internal folks who are focused on CARES um, and how to manage that. So hopefully we will have more information to report to you either via email at your or at your meeting next week. Um, again, WIT is also compiling for us uh, what they are seeing other communities do to manage their CARES funds. And so we will continue to update that for you uh, once this gets started. We are pretty, I know it doesn't feel like it, but we are actually pretty far along in this process relative to many of the clients that WIT is dealing with and relative to many other governments. So um, again, I know it doesn't feel like it, but I wanna give you some assurance that we're not necessarily behind the curve. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. If not, I will turn it over to Brent. Lindsay, it's a, a pretty overwhelming document to take yes. into account. Thank you for a lot of the work. It's obvious we, we know that you guys are work, working hard, and we appreciate it much. And, and, I'm, and I'm pleased that you're communicating with the other, uh, with Johnson County that's similar. So uh, I'm ready to move on, but Commissioner Cruz has a question. Thank you, Chairman. I just have one question relating to time frame. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry if you mentioned this and I missed it, but the time frame in which this will go up and the communication to get it out to the community. I mean, it's going to take a little bit to get people to know and then the drop dead date to have these in. Um, like how much time are we going to allow? So the goal, if we, uh, assuming you all approve this as is today, would be to have that posted first thing Friday um, and make it available to the public and we would put out a news release that day and also use every possible listserv chain we can think of and hopefully um, uh, prevail upon communications. I think they're happy to help us try and get this out on social media. So that would be posted Friday. They would have two, two weeks to respond to that assessment. Um, and then we would have essentially a week to package that information and hopefully around July 4th, we would be able to bring back um, some uh, general strategic plan for your discussion to actually get the dollars allocated and out to the community. Okay, so it goes up Friday, they have two weeks to submit, we take a week to package it, then when does the stimulus review team, how do they because they're the step before us, right? Right, they are. Okay, so uh, July 4th is when it's going to be packaged. That is, assuming you all approve the strategic plan as is that week, then essentially we would have an application form developed and ready to go uh, within a day or two, depending on whatever tweaks um, you make. And then folks would be able to make applications from that moment forward. And so then it will just depend on how quickly information could come in. Now, one part we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about today, but one of the things we will have to do is provide training to what they will, those, anyone who receives money from us will be called a subrecipient. Mm -hmm. And so those subrecipients are going to be subject to the same type of audits we are. Um, they're going to be subject to the same rules. And so we need to make sure that we are getting those folks educated on what the expectations are because the most recent round of guidance that came out from Treasury made it abundantly clear that the government receiving the funding is going to be the one on the hook. And so we'll try and protect ourselves as much as we can through funding agreements and everything. But I think a big part of protection will be that training on the front end. And so there may be a little bit of a lag depending on how sophisticated those entities are, if they've already received federal grants before so they know the drill or if we need to get them a little more training. Okay. So, so the community needs to be aware that, um, if I can get my calendar to work, we are sitting at 
June the 3rd. It's going to go live June the 5th. They'll have till the 19th of June. Is that correct? Yes. So Friday, the, Friday so, June 19th. So the community will have till June 19th to fill it out. And then will the 26th or, you know, probably... I just want to be clear with these dates because sure. I don't want people to come back and say, well, I didn't know, there wasn't enough time. <clears throat> Do you think that two weeks is enough time? From, from what the consultant has advised, yes, we think that should be plenty of time. Folks have already incurred most of these costs. They kind of know what's on the radar. And so it, it shouldn't be an overly burdensome process, we hope, for folks. And if that becomes a problem and we need more time, you know, we'll come back to you and ask. I, I think we definitely want to be flexible. Okay. so. Then once the package is put together, and this st have have we discussed stimulus review team and how that's going to happen, how community members can be involved with that, since we're not adding people to the voting uh, block of this stimulus review team, can we? How are we going to have open discussion and dialogue with community members who want to be involved? Well, we're discussing strategies to make that the stimulus review team will be a public meeting where public can watch. Uh, the question is going to be, uh, they're going to be wanting to get business done, the, the debate ongoing, and I'd kind of like to uh, meet with the team themselves on how much interaction or input citizens can throw into the meeting uh, without bogging them down to, to make the decisions they have, to, uh, they have to. So that's an ongoing discussion on how we're going to manage that, but it's clearly going to be a component. There's going to be a public open meeting component to their to their meetings okay I mean because you know we we as commissioners have already received some requests like sure. Genesis Health Clubs from Rodney Stevens sent us something um, you know the wave reached out um, there's a lot of people who have been reaching mm -hmm. out to us as individual commissioners and I want to make sure that we're doing everything above bars transparent as possible uh, people know what types of funding requests have been asked of us um, and the discussion is robust in a way that people can hear everybody's thoughts um, so that we, we make sure that we f allocate the funds in, in the most fair and equitable fashion. Yeah, absolutely. And I, hopefully that strategic plan that you all authorize, plus the eligibility guidelines and the consultant, will help really shape that process. Okay. Thank and, you. Okay. okay. No other comments, ready to move on. Okay, then I will turn this over to Brent to give you an update on that stimulus review team, and I would just ask maybe before you move off this item to the next that you do approve uh, this to go out um, as, as uh, proposed. Motion to approve. Second. Motion approved to go with the uh, notice of funding opportunity and solicitation of information document. Have any comments? Being none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. Chairman Meitzner? Aye. Okay. Brent? Good morning, Welcome Chairman Meitzner and uh, members of the County Commission. I'm Brent Shelton, your Deputy Chief Financial Officer. As Lindsay mentioned, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the, uh, uh, so far, the work that we've done with the Financial Stimulus Review Team. Um, Last Friday morning, we had a virtual meeting with the voting members of that team, those seven members, to do, in addition to just getting acquainted and kind of getting to know each other a little bit better, we talked about three things. One was the timeline, because as Lindsay mentioned, even though we're kind of getting along in this process, it may not seem like it, because there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but it seems like it's kind of moving slowly. So we wanted to make sure that the voting members understood what was going on, the things that we were doing uh, to get prepared for this. We spent some time talking about the CARES Act, those expenditures that were going to be eligible, the non-budgeted COVID-related expenses, that it wasn't going to be able to be used for revenue replacement. And we spent some time talking about the scope of this group. Uh, and as we you know, in its narrowest form, the scope of this group is to look at those applications and then come back to you with recommendations for your final approval on making allocations that are eligible under the CARES Act. There was some uh, pretty robust discussion on the committee about 
how do we make sure that word gets out to the community? And I think we came to a point that within the scope that we're provided after the strategic plan is developed and you've approved it, that this committee then will be in a position to be able to make recommendations that fall in line with the strategic plan that the commission sets forth. Um, they want to make sure that we've cast a, a wide net and that we're hearing from a, a broad cross-section of the community so that we do have enough data to assess the needs so that the money is used most effectively to benefit um, the citizens of the community as we go about allocating those CARES Act funds. They were also very interested in the training aspect as we go about training the subrecipients, those those local governments or other organizations that might be receiving the money that they have audits and fiscal controls in place and so forth and how we mitigate those risks. So I think to a person they're taking this very seriously. Um, I would also tell you that they're very eager to get started. One of the questions they ask is can we have these meetings in person and I assured them that we had a meeting room big enough in the in the courthouse that we could all get together because there'll be a documentation to review and so forth. So I'm excited about the uh, composition of the group, um, and they are, uh, I think we've got a, a good group of folks that are ready to take this seriously and do a good job for us. So with that, I'll answer any, any questions that you might have. Okay, Brent, you said, um, so are you calling this our stimulus review team? Is that their official title? Financial stimulus review team. Is there an acronym for that? FSRT. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you started out saying you're covering three items, did you say? And the first one was timeline and then timeline, uh, scope, and then the training aspect. All right. Okay. Because this is helpful since our, our commissioners, has been said before from Commissioner Cruz, I mean, we're getting questions on next steps, and mm -hmm. I think it, it really helps us to have a defined dates as Commissioner Cruz did and some of these one, two, three steps so we all have it handy and we're consistent. So right. that's my comment. Thank you. I'm glad you've had a meeting with them. I'm glad they're all enthused and right. taking this very serious. It's going to be some time on their hands for sure. Absolutely. Commissioner Cruz has a question. Thank you, Chairman. So you talked about having an in-person meeting with the stimulus re review team and you talked about having, you know, I mean, if, if we're going to have people ask questions and be involved, um, you know, how, I, I guess I just want to understand how, you know, if we have 50 people who want to get up and speak and, I mean, how are we going to, are we thinking large numbers like that of folks who might get up and, and need, I mean, want, want to have their voice heard? First of all, um, I hadn't had a chance to talk to Brent before the meeting. I'm glad to hear that they want to meet in person. That solves a lot of the problem. We could potentially even meet in this room and with seven people probably space them enough and get distancing. And we have access for um, Facebook Live and YouTube, everything in this room. could be possible we could put that out to the public so they can watch all that's happening. Now, the, the, the question is, and what I'd like some input back from the from that group is how do you manage everybody's going to have eight million opinions on how this money ought to be spent we got to manage this we have to keep it moving forward we want a really strict timeline with the money and we need to get we have to trust this group somehow to make good decisions and then ultimately it comes back to you so they have citizens will have two opportunities to hear this one will be with the advisory group and of course one will be when we come back to the meeting the question is how we manage the input coming in from citizens who want to give input uh, and yet still keep this moving and not bog it down with with um, unwieldy questions. So I think between now and when Brent stands this group up, we'll have that discussion. We'll come up with the best solution possible. Uh, and we'll give a, as much publicity to that, as much transparency to this as we possibly can. Are you guys talking about um, like percentages for certain types of things? I mean, it seems like you it, has that been talked about. I'll, I'll while Lindsay's, you're going to jump to the podium again, Lindsay. But I think that 
the strategic plan may head that direction. I'll let Lindsay clean this up, but certain percentages of the total would be allocated. I don't know if you want to chime in on that. Or. So that's one of the things that we're going to try to get through the needs assessment is what the scope is for each of those categories. And then, yes, whether it's a percentage or just a certain dollar amount, uh, depending on the type of need. And again, then having a strategic reserve set up, um, that would be probably a percentage, maybe 10%. Um, and so that'll all be part of that strategic funding recommendation that we bring to you. And, and just reiterate for me again, if folks have already received money or received other stimulus money, that will be part of this. Like, will it, will it knock them down on the totem pole as far as who gets what? So once we know who is eligible based on your strategic plan, anyone will be eligible to put in a, reverse, a reimbursement request. Mm -hmm. But one of the things they will have to do as a part of that is certify, maybe an affidavit, that they have not received other reimbursement for that from some other source, um, whether it be FEMA, some other CARES Act money, or maybe a future stimulus package. That will be, um, that will be a no-go. We will not be able to do that, and that's pretty clear in the guidance that that would get us in some trouble, and potentially them too. Okay. Um, is this document, I mean, we approved this document today. Is this document going to be anywhere, or is or we're waiting till Friday to drop everything? My, my plan had been to put it out on Friday when it was okay. approved, when we can roll everything at once. Okay. If you okay. would like to put it out today, we can put it out in that format. Unfortunately, there's just no mechanism for us to receive that That's information. That's fine. I just, wanna, I just I wanted to make sure we were all kind of clear on how this was going to roll out and when the community had access to information it sure. might be cleaner just to wait till friday i thought too we put it out on a website today so people could actually see it but i think that could confuse things it's probably better just to roll it friday when we're ready to <coughs> receive information back thank you no problem okay can i just uh, a quick and, and really a simple uh, a simple example for maybe the public so if let's say if you're if you're, <coughs> if, if you're a restaurant and you have gone out and built plexiglass and bought masks and you have a receipt for $650 worth of true COVID stuff that's documented, is that going to be something that a, a restaurant would submit and is those going to be kind of routinely rubber stamped as is approved? I mean, is thought process gone that far yet? On so that is what we're doing with that category number five in the notice of funding opportunity is to try and solicit what businesses have costs, potentially, and anyone else who we just haven't right. thought of that doesn't fall neatly into one of those other categories. So we want to know what costs they have. For the so COVID, for COVID, coping with right. COVID. COVID-related, March 1st, it wasn't right. in their budget. I mean, I don't know if restaurants right. maybe have budgets, but um, there would need to be some type of tracking mechanism for that. Okay. And so we want to know about those needs. That doesn't guarantee that it will be approved by you all as a part of the strategic plan, but it will help us to understand what's going on in the community. Okay. Okay. That, thanks. I just threw part, that part example. Of, I might add in, Chairman, part of the management of this is as those requests come in, as Lindsay alluded to in her presentation, we have to make sure that there's not, because there, this isn't the only funding stream. There's multiple funding streams happening uh, throughout this whole process. Right. And we want to make sure that maybe they could get that money from another funding stream. Maybe they've already gotten that money from another funding stream. So the burden is on us here to be a little bit investigative in this. And if, and if they truly is a need, then it makes the list goes to the committee, comes to you for final approval. That's that's kind of how this is going to have to roll. Okay. Commissioner Dennis has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, uh, during the discussions, I heard a couple things that concerns me a little bit. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, earmarking uh, money for certain aspects and another one rubber stamping uh, things. Both of those uh, are of concern to me because I think what we need to do finally is uh, first – is do the needs assessment. That's what the purpose of what we just approved today is we need to find out what the community needs. And then from the needs assessment, then we can go through and we can start prioritizing those needs and deciding what sh uh, how much to allocate for each of those different needs. So uh, I don't think that right now we're anywhere close to earmarking anything or saying that we're going to rubber stamp anything that comes in. Our first step, as I said, is a needs assessment. Thank you. And I agree. I, I might have got a little ahead of ourselves, Commissioner. I just was trying to. They, I just think the public, as Commissioner Cruz has been saying, like they're 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 eager for information and what ifs and examples and 
in time frames and so. Totally understand. Let me just clarify. I just want to clarify. Place? I absolutely 100 percent agree with you, Commissioner right. Dennis. I guess my what I was thinking was we have five different buckets, right? And how do we will will it be? I mean, if we have we have a certain amount of money, will we do five different buckets for five? You know what I mean? How how much are we going to? And maybe we're too too early, but. It's just a question that I had. I mean, I, I understand we need to make sure that we understand the entire scope. Like, I get that. But I think that there, um, there's a lot of different ways you could spend this money. Um, and I think that if there's folks in the community who are disproportionately affected, um, I think that we have to take in that, that into consideration. That, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. All right. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the, the uh, presentation and appreciate the comments and questions. Okay. We do not need any action on Brent's presentation, correct? So, okay. Is there anything else, Tom? I uh, will find there? Rusty here, and now we'll do actually the presentations for the ask. We'll have Rusty go first with the EMS vehicles, and then uh, Tim will talk about antibody testing. And when we, I might, Chairman, it's going to be a little bit clunky on the antibody testing because we're going to ring in Dr. Menz via phone when that discussion starts. So you have to give me just a second to get that done. Okay. Rusty, Hi, Rusty. welcome. Good morning again, Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, Rusty Leeds, Public Safety Manager. So uh, the manager and I had spoken to you a week or so ago and uh, about potential acquisition of, a, of some adding vehicles to the EMS fleet to facilitate uh, rapid advanced life support response into uh, rural areas of the county where ambulance response times are lengthy. Um, and in that discussion, just for clarification, uh, early on, not the discussion we had with you, but early on as we talked about this potential uh, model as a possible solution for some of those areas out in the western part of the county, uh, that are pretty remote away from EMS posts and away from county fire stations. Um, we had talked about potentially adding four vehicles. Uh, we rolled that back when we spoke to you last week to two vehicles, and those two vehicles would primarily uh, replace the ambulance that currently is, is stationed at Fire Station 39 uh, out just west of Goddard, and the crews that currently staff that would be transitioned into staffing these two rapid response advanced life support uh, vehicles that are non-ambulance, non-transport vehicles. So with that said, um, by doing that, what we would accomplish is, uh, you may recall from back in December, we had a discussion about Clearwater. Uh, while EMS strives to make all calls, regardless of priority, countywide. They strive to make those calls within about 10 minutes and 59 seconds. And if they're priority one calls, the more most severe cases, they try to make those within nine minutes and 59 seconds countywide. And in an urban area, they try to make those in less than nine minutes. Uh, that's, kind of their, that's kind of their baseline uh, standard that they try to meet. Uh, and if you recall in Clearwater, that's a 90th percentile response. In Clearwater, the 90th percentile has consistently been uh, greater than two times that amount. In 2019, for the year, it was approaching 23 minutes uh, for an ALS response. Uh, while you might get a first response from a fire, uh, the volunteer fire department in Clearwater, uh, a BLS uh, EMT response to get a paramedic on the scene who can push medicine and do advanced life support type care uh, could take as long as 23 minutes 90% of the time. So the, the purpose of these uh, rapid response vehicles is to reduce the response times into those remote areas of the county uh, and have a paramedic on scene promptly. If a transport is not needed, they can wave it off and they can manage this patient and make proper referrals after they've done all they can for the patient. If a transport is still necessary, you've got an advanced life support paramedic on scene caring for that patient, uh, getting best care until the ambulance can arrive. Once it arrives, the ambulance will transport that patient, still providing ALS care to the hospital, and your rapid response paramedic will complete their paperwork and be back in service in that area 
uh, almost instantaneously as opposed to that area having no coverage until an ambulance finishes at the hospital and returns to service maybe in 60 to 90 minutes depending on the type of call. So that's kind of the background on that. Um, through COVID, what we have seen is uh, obviously to date, as of yesterday, we've had 604 cases in the county. Uh, we've had 21 deaths. Uh, just for clarity, uh, EMS has tried to keep statistics on the calls that they've made. And in areas outside of Wichita, this doesn't include Wichita, this is areas outside of Wichita, which are our municipalities and our non unincorporated areas of Sedgwick County, uh, they've, they've managed 44 cases that were flagged in their system as COVID, potential COVID cases. Um, 20, 38 of those cases were in municipalities that require drives that push the, the time limits up to somewhere between 18 and 22 minutes, which would be your Clearwater, potentially Cheney, Viola, uh, and some of those outlying areas. And uh, they've had 26 COVID flag cases out in the unincorporated areas, and they've had 38 cases in those municipalities that, ha that require long drives to get an ALS paramedic to the scene. Um, so with all that information in mind, I come back to you today after our discussion a week or so ago uh, to, ask for, uh, to, to ask for you to authorize um, the addition of two vehicles to the EMS fleet to facilitate this rapid response uh, method of responding into those remote areas in the west and southwest part of the county, which would essentially cover uh, specifically Cheney and Clearwater, but also the townships, the Grand River, Morton and Erie townships, the Viola, Nenisca, and Ohio townships. Um, it would provide better response times to those areas. Uh, the Goddard Ambulance and the Sedgwick County Fire Department uh, stations in Andale and in Goddard would cover those other townships outside of those that I just named uh, with fairly uh, timely response uh, in those cases. So uh, the bottom line is, based on pricing that we have at the moment, and it's not exact, but it's, it's very, very close, um, the capital cost for the, the acquisition is about $60,000. To outfit both vehicles with emergency equipment and, and, and other equipment that they need, that the paramedics need, would be 47772 and then in the first year, having acquired those vehicles, there would be fleet charges so that uh, our fleet uh, director and her staff could do regular maintenance and maintain those vehicles and also pay for the fuel, the fuel costs. So the total cost of acquiring the two vehicles is uh, estimated right now at 117, 157. Uh, for your information, we've been vetting this through uh, Widow Bryan's and also through BKD and uh, both of those returned within the last couple of days indicating that having vetted this through the CARES Act requirements that they, that they are giving advice that these, this acquisition is uh, appropriate and would be uh, acceptable under the CARES Act funding. Uh, so based on that, the, the request again would be that you authorize the addition of two fleet vehicles to the EMS fleet um, and that you authorize budget authority for at least 117,157 uh, Speaking to the fleet director this morning, she indicated there might be a very small plus or minus factor on the acquisition cost of the vehicles because she's still trying to finalize pricing with the vendor, uh, but that is very, very close. So if you have questions, I will stand for those at this time. Commissioner Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've talked about this for some time. Uh, actually, uh, Commissioner O'Donnell and I have been very concerned about our districts uh, on uh, being able to, to provide uh, uh, EMS support to, to our citizens out there. Uh, we've had discussions uh, both in my district and Commissioner O'Donnell's district for some time about this. Uh, uh, one thing that uh, is important to, uh, is that uh, transport is really not the most important. Uh, it's not the longest pole in the tent. Uh, it's who we get there first uh, that has the qualifications to preserve life. Uh, and that's why that this uh, program that Dr. Gallagher uh, came up with is, is so critical because it gets uh, a paramedic that can preserve life there immediately and then decide whether or not that we need transport later on. Uh, we, 
were very worried about things like down in Clearwater where that uh, we had a nursing home that had a large uh, group of number of individuals that had uh, health problems. So uh, in the meantime, when, once I, I started talking to Dr. Gallagher about this, I did call the mayor of, uh, of uh, Jeannie, and he was very excited about the uh, option, and, and he volunteered uh, to house uh, this vehicle in, in their facilities. So we've got a place to put them on top of that, which he didn't brief about, but uh, that's important. Uh, in Clearwater, we've got a place to put them. Uh, so, uh, I completely support uh, the decision uh, that, uh, or the recommendation that Dr. Gallagher and, and the staff has come up with. Uh, I think it's a, a great opportunity for us. We have the personnel available right now out of Station 39, uh, and uh, so I, I've been a supportive of this all along. So I'd like to make a recommendation that uh, that we approve the vehicles, the equipment, uh, and authorize up to $125,000 uh, to be able to. Uh, uh, fund this operation. Thank you. I'll second that. And Commissioner O'Donnell, you had the comments also? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, um, Rusty, thank you to you and your staff. And if Dr. Gallagher was here, I'd give him big kudos. We've had multiple meetings with Clearwater about this. I think they're excited to finally have something in a, um, a contract form and ready to get going. And, and they've been exceptional partners. I. I think when we get the press release ready, we'd like to acknowledge that, that Clearwater has been so helpful in um, working with us with facilities and, and every other aspect along the way. So I'd like uh, communications to get something ready and to acknowledge that so we can get that out today. So thank you, Rusty. Yes, sir. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Uh, Commissioner Howell has a comment? Yeah, well, thank you. Of course. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm curious on the time that you provided a few minutes ago. Is that just for an ambulance response or is that for? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll start again. Um, thank you for the thank you for the information. I am curious though, um, when you provided those time uh, averages, does that include just the ambulance response or is that all first responders? Yes, sir. On the Clearwater number that I gave you is the ambulance response only. Okay. Just Again, I may, I may not be exactly right in my total numbers here, but I believe we have, I think, 17 ambulance fire, or ambulance stations at this point in, across our county. But uh, Sedgwick County has 15 fire stations, but if you count all fire stations, there's actually 40 fire stations in our, in our county. And most of the fire stations are, are manned with uh, five people per shift, 24 hours a day, and so I, I just want the public to understand that we're concerned about making sure we get there quickly with the best care possible. But I don't want people to feel like if they make a 911 call that someone's not going to show up for 25 minutes. The reality is we've got uh, a lot more firefighters out there that are all EMT certified. And they provide, uh, they can control bleeding, they can open airways, they can provide CPR. And so although they're not paramedics, they can't administer medicines, they can do a lot of things to, to, um, to, to, protect and, and sustain life until a paramedic does show up. And so the public needs to know that. And I think that, again, this is a, a good thing. I think this is a, a good model. Um, but uh, I just want people to understand that if they call 911, they don't have to wait 25 minutes to get someone on scene that can provide those services. I think that everyone needs to know that. And so I want to recognize our EMTs as part of our system of care. And uh, obviously the, the highest level of care uh, is needed in certainly some of these calls, and so that's what this would provide. So I'll be glad to support the motion this morning. Thank you. Okay, I see no other comments. Uh, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Hell? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. Chairman Meitzner? Aye. Thank you. And Next item, please. Uh, Commissioners, as, as Tanya gets Dr. Minns on the line, um, just a reminder, we had a pretty robust discussion. Tim presented a kind of a comprehensive plan yesterday regarding uh, testing. And the one component that, uh, that's hanging out there yet is the acquisition of uh, antibody testing. So that's the discussion we're preparing to have. So.
true typical doctor we have to, it's good we had a call a couple of times to stand by and if not we'll get tim started yeah i was gonna say tim go ahead any, any preamble keep trying to reach him. Uh, Tim, go ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, as Tom just mentioned, uh, I'm sorry, Tim Kaufman, Deputy County Manager. As Tom just mentioned, we've had a number of different discussions about um, lots of different testing. We've talked about antibody testing. We talked about it again yesterday, and Tom suggested that I come today with a specific number in mind. And so... Um, Thank you for uh, joining us. Um, Tim has just gotten started, sir. We're getting ready to talk about um, antibody testing. So if you do, you, are you able to hear the meeting or uh, I think commissioners will have questions for you uh, and I can relay them. So I just wanted to, we are discussing it right now and want to know your access. So. Well, I, I'll just stay put on the phone, I guess. All right. Very good, sir. Go ahead, Tim. All right. Thanks. Um, so we we had talked uh, we've talked a number of times about antibody testing, and Tom suggested it would be helpful if we talked about a specific number, and um, made a request uh, for consideration for some CARES funding. Um, we have been talking to a vendor about being able to do the blood draw on our behalf. Um, so staff's involvement again would be more data analysis. We would utilize the private sector to do the actual blood draw and the testing and get the results to us. And um, the price that we have received right now, again, it's a little bit tentative. I talked yesterday about availability. Um, the vendor that we've talked to does not have um, materials available right this minute. They think that they would have some in a couple of weeks. And um, we've had two different numbers um, to consider. I think one uh, number that has been suggested by some is that we test 500 folks. And another number that I would offer is that uh, 1,401 that we're going to use for our random sample on the um, nasopharyngeal test because that's a statistically significant number. And so if we were to, based on the estimated prices that I've received, a request for uh, 500 samples would be uh, roughly $30,000, and a request for that 1,401 would be roughly $85,000. So those are the two numbers that I would offer to you as a suggestion that we could um, seek your budget your budget a, a approval for uh, budget authority to make those that acquisition. Um, in talking with Lindsay, it appears that Widow O'Brien has not um, confirmed that antibody testing would be a, re, a reimbursable expense at this point in time. I don't know that if that's tied to the timing. Um, uh, as I've suggested, as I suggested yesterday, it might just be too early. Um, in the process to be doing this, but right now we don't have confirmation that this would be reimbursable under the CARES Act. But I'd be glad to answer any questions. Okay, so um, based on all the information we've had about this, and uh, could we uh, consider uh, waiting until uh, Widow O'Brien could officially tell us if it is... Uh, CARES eligible or not. I'm just throwing that out there. I, Does Widow O'Brien have an idea when they would know if I, this was And I'll let, uh, if Lindsay needs eligible. to talk, but we talked about this yesterday. I, I don't know that it's a question of whether it's CARES eligible. I think Widow O'Brien's opinion on it, correct me if I'm wrong, Lindsay, but was their opinion of this, it is not quite ready yet. Um, they're recommending uh, to hold off on antibody testing, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that their opinion on that? Uh, yes. So, uh, Lindsay Perso, CFO, the um, feedback we've had because we have brought that up that antibody testing is something that the commission is potentially interested in pursuing. What they have indicated is that in other communities that are doing this where they have medical officers who have been involved in the CARES discussion is that maybe that testing isn't the most reliable yet. And so it's not necessarily, to Tom's point, a question of whether it's eligible. I think it would be eligible. I think it's a matter of... 
um, the, whether the test we actually get is found to be the reliable type, if it can give the right type of data. And so they were encouraging us to maybe hold off on that and wait until the data comes out that shows it's reliable. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Cruz has a question. Thank you. I'd like to hear from Dr. Menz. Dr. Menz, have you been able to hear the uh, conversation at all? Yes. Okay. Yes. Could you go ahead? I think commissioners would like you to comment on this. Okay. Well, thank you all for uh, letting me uh, provide some information. I would like to emphasize before I talk about this test that I've talked this over with my colleagues in the infectious disease community, both locally and with those in the Kansas City area, particularly at the Medical Center in Kansas City. And we're all in consensus that the antibody tests that are currently available for purchase are, have not been vetted and they have not been validated. And so we don't know how they would be used. So any test you do on patients, you need to know what you're trying to determine. And if you're trying to determine whether someone has immunity, these tests are not able to determine that at this time. We haven't had enough time to validate these in independent labs. I have read the literature that the companies have on this, and they would claim that they are valid, but that was not done by an unbiased independent validator. And until they have done that, it's, it's not a test that we physicians would put confidence in. If you look at the CDC's recommendation that was printed on May 26th of this year, they say they are not accurate enough to use to make important policy decisions. Any test that we do must be, one, accurate, and it must ask, answer a question that is important to our care of patients and our public health issues. So at this time, I can tell you that we just don't have confidence in this. It's a tool that was developed for physicians and the physician community that I'm aware of and my consultants and colleagues in Kansas City all agree this test is not ready for prime time. And I don't think, in my, public, my opinion, this would be a good use of taxpayer money to spend money on a test that we physicians don't know what the results mean. Can I take any questions at this if you have any? Okay. Well, Dr. Mays, that was a, a, good, a good summary introduction. I think, Commissioner Cruz, I'm sorry, do you still have more? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so would it be your recommendation um, for the commission to just outright deny this funding or defer to a later date? I don't mind if you defer to a later date, but it's not going to be soon. It would probably be months before we would have any validation results until we feel comfortable this test really gives us information that is valuable to care of our patients or public health policy. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. Menz. I appreciate you calling in. Um, I know you're a busy guy. Um, so, you know, the, the information that you sent out, Tim, yesterday, you know, the CDC, I have it pulled up right here. You know, the second bullet says currently there is no identified advantage. I spoke with two physicians in our community, so I, I have heard the same things from a couple of physicians here as well. The FDA um, recommendation that you sent, I mean, the articles that are clear from reputable sources. Um, so that, to me, spending $115,000 before we do our assessment from the community, I mean, we think we have a lot of money, right, Ninety-some million dollars but depending on how many people in our community have spent money, um, I think that it's too early. So I would make a motion to defer this until a later date. Okay. Uh, we have one more question from Commissioner Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, Dr. Menz, I, I guess my question is the test that we're doing now, the nasal pharyngeal test, if I said it right. Uh, yes. That tests at one point in time and what what we learn is on that day that the individual got that test uh, they either had uh, uh, COVID-19 or they didn't have COVID-19 what it doesn't Correct. tell is if they've uh, come in contact with before and have antibodies and it doesn't tell us whether the next day that uh, they end up uh, coming in contact with someone that has it, and uh, at that point in time, uh, they can uh, be infected with it. Uh, so uh, I guess as policymakers uh, on trying to figure out how that uh, we safely uh, monitor our citizens so, so that uh, we can get the economy going and, and start solving some of these other problems that we have. We just heard today we've had nine suicides within the last two and a half weeks. Uh, 
uh, I, I don't know what what data that we can get that's going to help us. Uh, so what I look at, and I said this yesterday, is that the, the nasal pharyngeal test is like a snapshot. It's valid at the instant that that person took that test. What we need is a motion picture rather than just a snapshot. Uh, we need to know what the scope is across the community uh, of this uh, disease, or this virus rather. Uh, and I, so you, you're going to have to help me. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what else we can do if it's not a, a, an antibody test. How do we know what the extent of this virus is across our community? How do we get this motion picture? So we are planning to do a prevalence testing in the next few weeks in which we will do the PCR, the test you've alluded to, not the antibody test, on a random sample of people to see how widely this virus is active in our community. That will be probably the best thing we can do. I don't deny that we would like more information, but please realize we've only had this virus about four months to work with, and we're all, including the scientific medical community, are still learning about this. And what we know today, the antibody test will not answer your question. We hope in the future we have better tests, but we are very early in studying this virus and developing tools to help us with it, and I acknowledge that. But so far, the data shows that these antibody tests will not answer the question you have asked. Okay. I'm sad about that. I wish that wasn't the case. One of these days, we hope we will have a good test that will tell us what you have asked. But today, that does not exist to our knowledge. Okay, well, whatever you can do to, to keep us informed on what kind of tests that we can get, because we need to know the prevalence of this throughout the community if we're going to make decisions uh, like we made uh, back in March uh, on to shut the, the economy down. We don't ever want to do that again. But yeah. we need to know the scope of this, and right now we don't I, have a handle on it. I, I can assure you all of us want better tests, and all of us are waiting for the day when we have those. But we have to make sure the tests will actually answer the question that we need answered, not invest our money in a test that's inaccurate, which is what the antibody tests appear to be today. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Dennis. And uh, Dr. Menz, one more question. Uh, Commissioner O'Donnell has a question. <clears throat> this isn't necessarily a question for Dr. Menz, but, but I would um, like to offer a substitute motion that we yeah. Ex excuse oh, me, Commissioners. Sorry. I think, as, and I was about to break in, I think as a matter of procedure, there should have either been a second or no second on uh, Commissioner Cruz's well, I'll, motion. I'll, I'll make a second on the, on the... Okay. The motion was to defer... To defer this matter. Defer until at a future date. Mm -hmm. That's okay. correct. I'll, I'll second that. Okay. 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 Thank you. Now I can make my substitute motion. Sure. I, I would like a substitute motion that, for a date certain, for June 17th, to have Dr. Min's get with us to see we're learning stuff every day about this virus about testing antibody testing just last week we were at a meeting with the manager and uh, uh, deputy uh, manager uh, Tim Kaufman with some doctors that said even early June they're expecting different testing and different types of results that that I'd like to have dr. Minns come to a meeting my motion would be for two weeks give us an update on what testing is both the antibody testing and and uh, some of the oral testing that is uh, um, supposed to be approved by the FDA this week. And then at that point, I think we can make a much more educated decision on how to move forward with antibody testing, because I do agree with Commissioner Dennis, it would be very helpful to get that out there, but I want to make sure that we know exactly what's happening. And I think if we allow staff and Dr. Min's um, two weeks to get back with us, we'll, we'll know um, uh, a lot more as we are learning by the day. So that's my subject Second. motion. Okay, Commissioner Cruz. Well, there's no real need for a substitute motion. All I have to do is amend my motion to say I'd like to defer for two weeks. All right, I think we need to I address did, this. I, I didn't give a date. That, that's true, Commissioner. It's but the I same think, thing again. Well, I think since that wasn't an original motion and since there's been a substitute motion and that's been seconded, I think we vote on the substitute motion. So. Okay. Uh, there's a substitute motion. Um, I don't really see the relation between the two very much. I'm, I'm okay with deferring the, the antibody testing till whenever Dr. Menz is coming, or or have we have more information, and I'm okay with Dr. Menz coming to address our, 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 our commission, 
whenever whenever we want him to or whenever he feels that, hey, I've got some breaking news. Well, so, I, uh, just, I just feel like two weeks gives – sorry, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, right. go ahead. I just feel like two weeks gives a, a definite time for staff to look at other options as well. I think the issues that Commissioner Dennis brought up are um, – extremely valid and we need to we need to be moving somehow so i thought uh, yeah i can i can appreciate that i, I like i said I, I don't i don't see the relevance I, i'm going to support the first motion but i this one is i'm, I'm hoping that any time the uh, commission or the manager wants dr Mins to be available he's going to be available so i'm getting positive nods on that okay any other comments being none, uh, Madam Clerk, call the roll on the substitute motion. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. <clears throat> Chairman Meitzner? No. Okay. The motion carries four to one. Thank you, Dr. Mintz. Thank you, Dr. Right. Mintz. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. We're on to the next item. I think, Madam Clerk, uh, next item, please. Item E, two resolutions authorizing the creation of benefit districts for the construction of Phase 1 and Phase 2 road improvements in Osage Country Edition in consideration of a request by the developer for 20-year financing for the improvements. Good morning. Jim Weber, Deputy Director of Public Works, and I'll just start this today. We've got a couple of things to deal with. The first one is uh, two petitions for the paving improvements. Garth Herman's here from our bond council, Gilmar and Bell, and, and he'll walk through that with you. And then uh, after that's done, uh, I'll come back and we need to talk about um, the developer's request for 20-year bonds as opposed to 15, and uh, give you the numbers to break all that down for you. So, Garth. Uh, good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Garth Herman with morning, Gilmore and Bell, the County's Bond Council. Um, as Jim Wimber mentioned, um, we have basically uh, two projects uh, closely uh, related for consideration by the Board this morning. Um, they're both for Osage Country Edition uh, Road Improvements Phase 1 and Phase 2. Um, I'll probably do this uh, Phase 1 first and kind of go through that resolution and then we'll get to phase two. It'll be a very similar, uh, similar resolution on that. So I'll just start with the phase one. Um, the first item up will be the resolution that actually creates uh, the benefit district for the road improvements for Osage Country Edition phase one. Um, the owner of the property out there has submitted a petition to the county requesting that the county make uh, certain road construction improvements to serve 22 lots that are going to be located in the phase one property. Here is a map of where the Osage Country Edition um, Improvement District is going to be located. It's down in the southwest part of the county. Um, in between, I believe it's, um, let me put my glasses on here. I think it's MacArthur Road and 31st Street. And then it's adjacent to 151st Street um, down south. And phase one is basically the 22 lots that are outlined in red right here. And as I said, the request is to have uh, road improvements made to serve those 22 lots that are included in the, in the red defined area right there. Um, the petition, which also matches the resolution that's in front of you, has requested the construction of those improvements at the estimated cost of $755,000. The costs of that road improvement will actually be assessed against the benefit of properties. As I mentioned, there's 22 lots. Those 22 lots will equally share the costs of those road construction projects. So basically, once they're done, once the, uh, once the road has actually been, or all of the roads have actually been built, um, and, the city, and the county is ready to go ahead and specially assess those, then basically all of those costs of the construction, design, inspection, engineering, as well as the costs related to the county's financing um, of those projects will be specially assessed against those 22 lots on an equally per lot basis. Um, there is no allocation of the cost between the county and the benefit district itself, so 100% of those costs will be assessed against the property um, and 0% will be shared uh, by the city at large, or by the county at large, I apologize. And, um, and basically, in order to start that process, 
this is the resolution that basically formally accepts um, the petition and authorizes those projects to move forward and authorizes the county to go ahead and issue the general obligation bonds to finance those costs uh, when the time is appropriate. And up next on the, um, on the PowerPoint there is, is the estimate of the total project costs um, for this phase one project. And that's, uh, that's the information I have for the, the first resolution. So with that being said, uh, are there any questions? Yes. You said 755,000, but your spreadsheet there shows 729. Is that up? And I believe, I believe the, the difference in that amount, um, that was actually the 755,000 is what was based on the estimates included in the petition. I believe that the, um, the estimate that's included here may have slightly more refined costs on there. When it comes time to actually um, do the project and bond them themselves, basically that estimated cost is, is um, you know, the ballpark of what they're looking to spend on it. If those costs actually come in less than that estimate, then the county will only need to bond the amount of those actual costs. So if it actually comes in at $720,000, sure. then the actual cost will be that $720,000 plus assessment. the cost of financing. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And Commissioner Hallis, question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just wanted to ask: these are these lots don't have improvements on them already? The houses are not built. I, I believe that's correct, Jim. So the short answer is no, but the little bit longer answer is that uh, this has been platted, zoned, and platted, and you've seen those cases. And so part of that process is they have to put up guarantees, financial guarantees, for how the improvements will be made. In this case, uh, the developers chosen to do paved streets in the petition. This process is one of the, uh, of the uh, methods of financial guarantee that's allowed. So these will go in. Uh, they can't build houses in there until these streets are in. They've had to put up a letter of credit to cover us for 35 percent of the amount of the special assessments. If they go into default for some reason, we go to the bank and we get the first 35 percent letter of credit would be dropped when they've got 35 percent of the homes built on each phase it's phase by phase so so they plan to sell the lots and build the houses in the subdivision here but if they don't sell those lots or build those homes when do, do they do they have responsibility to start making the installments back to the county on year one yes well the bonds are probably a year out depending on what else we're doing that gets packaged with another the bond issue that we're doing we don't do these separately uh, we'll go through the actual assessment process with you when when it's all completed um, and uh, we're you know we won't see houses start probably till next spring but the property owner of record at the time is responsible for making the special assessment payments so any lot that the developer still holds they're responsible for making the special payments and again if he goes in and default we go to the bank and get the money uh, if as soon as he sells one of those lots, then that new owner becomes responsible for the specials. And five years later, it sells again. It just keeps moving to the subsequent owners. Okay. And and this is a little bit different than that's 20 years. That's one of the reasons it's coming before us today. Normally, well, we, we, would we have a resolution in front of us for this type of uh, action today, or is this? This is the standard to approve the project. Uh, we need to do this to for us to be able to move forward. And do, we would build the project publicly. All the costs are going to get assessed. The second issue with the 20-year bonds is more of an administrative thing of are we going to do 15 or 20 as he's requested? And so the, the length of the bonds isn't even a part of this resolution. That's kind of we have it as a second discussion. Okay. All right. Thank you for the uh, answers. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner Dennis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is there a reason we break this up into two different resolutions, or why can't we take it as one? Um, we usually try to break them up into two different resolutions for each phase. That way, if for some reason phase one moves a little bit quicker than phase two, um, then basically they can be bonded and special assessed separately. Um, that's just kind of administratively how they're normally handled. Um, with this being basically, you know, kind of all one big project, but simply split up into phases, um, it, it could have been done as a single resolution. But like I said, generally, we try to split them up into separates for each separate phase. 
Very good. Well, as as uh, Jim Weber said, uh, this is a uh, fairly routine process. It's just not too routine for Sedgwick County because we haven't had a lot of development in Sedgwick County recently. But uh, it happens in the city all the time. Uh, the, the developer goes through uh, a uh, zoning requirement, then the, they go through a planning requirement, uh, and then they get ready to build something. And uh, uh, that's where we're at right now, is uh, them getting ready to put the roads and, and uh, other improvements in. So. Uh, I don't want anyone to think that this is out of the ordinary, what we're doing today. This is absolutely the way the process works. Uh, so therefore, I make a motion that uh, we approve uh, uh, phase one uh, of uh, Osage County addition. Second. Make a motion and second. Commissioner Cruz. So when this developer, um, like, can you guys talk to me about the history of the 15 year versus 20 year? I, not to interrupt, I'm sorry, but uh, that's not what the discussion is at this time. We'll have a separate discussion on that. Please don't tell me when I can when I can ask a question. I'd like to ask that question now. Would that be okay? Well, that's fine. I'm okay. just to let Thank you know you, what the motion was. Dennis. So um, we've had a debt policy from back in the 80s, I think, and uh, I've been doing these since about 90, and uh, the debt policy calls for 15-year bonds on special assessments. It allows 20-year bonds on other types of bonds that the county does. And so this debt policy has been revisited a couple of times. That part has not changed. Um, it's, uh, and Lindsay's here, and I'm not going to... It's all... I, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's about what are the things that give the county a good bond rating, and one of them would be turnover in your debt. And so... 15 makes sense to most people for special assessments. We're doing them as a, um, a way to facilitate private investment. It's not for the county, but it helps the county. And so a thought, I think, has been, let's keep those going a little bit quicker. Other things that we do, if you were, um, an example would be the household hazardous waste building it was a 20-year bond. It's a long-term project. It's an infrastructure for the county that we're using, and you got to fit it into your budgets. So I think there's it's just a balance going on. The statutes allow 20-year bonds on special assessments, but we don't do it. And I, I would add that uh, you're right, that that's uh, typically on, <clears throat> in our area, housing developments, roads, and getting utilities there have always been a, in, in a 15-year in a uh, bonding world, which is what the proposal is as of now on this phase one. Right, and I think that, I don't want to get too far ahead, but the developers uh, pointing out that there, are, uh, Wichita has a policy that if you're in a certain expense category for the value of the lot, um, you can go to 20. Some communities are just doing 20. Some have policies like Wichita's where they make a decision about whether it's going to be 15 or 20. I think Commissioner Dennis had a good point in that, um, you know, 20 years ago we did a lot of these. Uh, we were up here constantly. Um, it's much less common since in the last 10 years. Um, so it just hasn't been something that anybody has requested. We haven't really had to work this issue. Lindsay looks like she would like to speak. No? Okay. I have a, I have Does a that help? I mean. Yeah, I mean, this is a complicated issue for someone who's been doing this for a year and six months. So I, I appreciate you giving me um, an explanation to a question that I had. Um, so thank you for that. And I would just take the opportunity to point out or repeat kind of what I think Garth has said. Whatever it is, all of the cost goes to this property. Uh, if there are 20-year bonds and the interest was going to be higher, the total interest paid out over time is going to be higher. It's all going to go back to this property. The system, the policies that we have are all designed to take all of our costs, wrap them up in this project, and make sure they're getting paid by the developers. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I have a, one quick question. Um, I can't read the, my, my eyes are not, this is, the bottom line number says $2,981 a year? Yes, 2981 okay. is the estimate for the repayment of the principal amount if that is over a 15-year period per lot. Yeah, per yeah. lot. And my other question is on the map, somebody else probably can help me. 
is this development close to a to a city that would be annexing it shortly after it's put in? I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at the map. I can't. I, I can't really. I'm sorry, uh, Chairman. What was the question? Well, my question is: when this is done on the borderline of of Wichita city limits, that immediately they they, they approach Wichita to to get this done and then have an annexation process. So That's right. the question is: is this development close to a to a municipality that no. would be? Right now, it's, I think it's about two miles out. The map is hard to read, but it's about two miles out from the city limits. It's in the, um, their urbanizing area. If you look at the urbanizing area map, which is part of what controls um, what improvements they can make and so on. But uh, they're going to be a ways before they could or would be annexed. But you're absolutely right. If they were right up against the city, the platting zoning process would have brought them into the city, and these improvements would be happening through the city of Wichita. All right, thank you. Motion and a second. Any more questions? I don't see any. Uh, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Hal? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. Chairman Meitzner? Aye. Motion carries. Next part. All right, thank you very much. Um, this is a very similar resolution. This is for phase two of Osage Country Editions. Um, same area, basically, this will be for the uh, western, in essence, half of that addition. Um, they're still requesting, due to a petition that was submitted to the county, that the county authorize and construct uh, road improvements to serve that western half of the addition. In this case, unlike the, the previous resolution where the cost will be split amongst 22 lots, um, in this case, the, the total cost will be split amongst 32 lots. There will be 32 lots in the western half of this addition. Um, the estimated cost of the improvements for this case are $1,010,000. Once again, all of those costs will be assessed against those 32 lots on an uh, equal basis, and 100% uh, will be assessed and 0% will be carried by the county at large. Um, otherwise, it's, it's a very similar process uh, to the previous uh, petition and resolution. Um, so with that being said, um, I'll stand for any questions that you may have. Commissioner Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, once again, uh, uh, you answered my questions on why they couldn't be combined, uh, but they are really identical uh, resolutions. Uh, they're just uh, to do the second half of, uh, of this uh, development uh, once that he gets to the point that he's ready to start working the second half of this development. Uh, so I make a motion that uh, we approve the resolution creating a benefit district uh, in Sedgwick County for Osage uh, Country Edition Phase 2. Second. Okay, motion and a second. Any questions? I have a couple, just again, uh, I'm trying to look at the next slide. How much? Yeah, what, so down, down there at I the bottom of that it. slide, uh, the estimate is $2,702 in principal assessment per lot, and that's assuming that it's uh, over a 15-year uh, repayment period and, and as we discussed the, the difference between the 15 and the 20 years will come up uh, next during that discussion on the county's policy but two thousand seven hundred two dollars okay. um, per lot okay thank you motion and a second any other questions being none madam clerk call the roll commissioner o'donnell aye commissioner dennis aye commissioner howell aye commissioner cruz aye chairman meitzner aye thank you all very much So if we could take a few minutes to talk about debt financing uh, for this project. Um, so our current debt policy, which again goes back to the 80s, uh, does indicate that we use 20 year or less bonds for general obligation bonds, public building commission bonds, or revenue bonds. And again, those are things that are generally bonds sold to do some function that the county is trying to do. We do have a provision for 15 or years or less on the special assessment bonds, uh, which again are exclusively used to promote some kind of development uh, in the county. So just to 
let you know, uh, Mr. Kelly did not come in today because of social distancing. Uh, I did talk to him yesterday. I believe he's talked to Commissioner Dennis as well. Um, and he's simply asked that I give you the full story and, uh, and I'll do the best I can. Um, he is, if you're looking at this slide, this subdivision, 54 lots total on 80 acres. These end up being one acre minimum size lots. They go up from there a little bit. To give you some perspective, uh, most of us who live in the city of Wichita probably live on uh, a third or a fourth of an acre. There's three or four, three to five lots per acre would normally come out of one of these. So um, it is a fact that these kinds of subdivisions do require a lot more street length per lot, which takes their principal cost for the improvement up higher than um, maybe comparable stuff inside the city of Wichita. He does not feel like the 15-year specials uh, would work in the market that he needs some relief, would like to go to 20-year bonds. Um, and he didn't feel like the subdivision regulations were really very clear about what, uh, uh, what our bonding required. We have a clear debt policy, but he didn't feel like it was clear in what he's working with doing the subdivision in the subdivision policy. Um, he's formally requested a 20-year special, and you have the ability to just make that decision. It's, um, I don't even think we're asking for a resolution. It's just to give us some direction. Uh, here's some numbers. Um, phase one, their principal, lot, principal amount per lot is 33,146. Um, same numbers you saw just a minute ago. The 15-year assessment is 2981. We do it a calculation for 20-year assessment is 2439. It's about an 18% reduction in the annual payment for the homeowners. Uh, works out to about $45 a month. The phase two is slightly less. Uh, I think the larger number of lots and uh, how he's had to kind of front load some of the drainage has caused the phase one to be a higher amount than phase two. So he's at $30,000 on principal amount, 2702 for the 15, 2201 for the 20 year special. Again, about 18% reduction by going to the 20 or 4175 a month. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, you know, why the 15 year policy? Uh, Again, bond ratings for government are kind of like your credit score, and the quicker your payback are, the better your scores are. Uh, special assessments are there to facilitate targeted investments and to assist private development, and it's felt that they should have a quicker turnover. Uh, other types of bonds support general government operations, and so longer periods may be required for financial feasibility. And I think that, I don't have it on the slide, but there is a, uh, an idea I think that's important that, as a Sedgwick County, we're really not trying to draw development out into the county. Um, whether it happens in the county or in the state of limits, it's still part of the county's tax base. So I don't think it's been uh, seemed to be important to try to incentivize people to come out. So the 15 years kind of worked with that too, uh, trying to keep development kind of bunched up instead of getting scattered around. Um, there is a proposed regulation change. Um, we had met with you uh, months ago, pre-COVID-19, if anybody can remember that far back. Um, there's an amendment that's been working through uh, Planning Commission. In fact, they're going to hear it tomorrow uh, that would clarify in the subdivision regulations for future developers that you need to go to the county's bond policy to figure out what you can and can't do. Um, Justin thinks uh, that'll probably get to the board here in another four to six weeks if it gets approved by the Planning Commission tomorrow. So we think your alternatives would be uh, approved Mr. Kelly's request to direct the staff to proceed with the 20 year financing for Osage Country Phase 1 and 2 special assessments. Or we'd like, alternatively, you could deny the request, direct the staff to do 15 year uh, special assessments, or take whatever action you think is appropriate. And I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Commissioner Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to give a, a little bit more history on this, uh, uh, this was zoned and platted some time back. Uh, and after the zoning and platting, and this is not the first uh, uh, subdivision that Mr. Kelly has put together. He put together one about a mile from uh, this location. And uh, at that time, uh, the cost of putting in the roads and so forth uh, was uh, much lower than what it uh, is now because everything has gone up a lot. So as a result, he came and, and uh, chatted with me. Uh, we got finance involved, uh, we got the planning department involved, we got public works involved, uh, and we talked through this. Uh, and what we found uh, was that uh, 
there was nothing uh, whatsoever in our subdivision regulations that said, hey, Sedgwick County normally uh, does 15-year uh, bonds rather than 20-year bonds. And both of them are, are really authorized. Uh, in addition, we've got some finance uh, regulations uh, that really don't uh, uh, define that we would prefer 15-year bonds. So uh, we, he spent a lot of money getting to the zoning and planning and, and, uh, and working with public works uh, to get to this point. And the bottom line is that uh, uh, he needs the 20-year bonding uh, in order to, uh, to uh, make this uh, operation feasible, and he's already incurred a huge expense. Uh, it's not against our regulations anywhere uh, to do this. It says normally we do 15-year bonds, but it uh, doesn't say that we can't do 20-year bonds. Uh, as a result of the discussions we had with planning department, uh, I did ask them to go back and, and look at the subdivision regulations and put something in, and that's what uh, Jim Weber just talked about, that uh, we're, we're going to see if we can put something in our subdivision regulations that uh, really meets what we would rather do with our bonding. Uh, but uh, right now, nothing prohibits the 20-year bonding. Uh, so I, I believe that the direction MAPD is going is the right direction for the future. Uh, I believe that we probably need to take a look at our finance uh, regulations on how that we do bonding and uh, make some changes there to let everyone know. Uh, but right now there is nothing that prohibits us or, or directs us one way or the other on, on how many years that we bond. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, uh, uh, in order to make this a very successful uh, operation, uh, a new development in the county, which we are always looking for new developments because it increases our tax base, uh, it does great things for our economy. Uh, I would like to, to move that uh, we approve the request and direct staff to proceed with the 20 year financing for Osage uh, County Phase 1 and Phase 2 special assessments. Second. Okay, Commissioner Cruz. Thank you. Was bonding discussed when this project was originated? No. Um, Is that general practice? Well, no, because we think, thought, everybody understood it was 15. And uh, Mr. Kelly and another gentleman had done a subdivision that Commissioner Dennis had referred to, you know, 15 years earlier. And so... So uh, the 15 year earlier... Um, was 15 development year. was 15 years yes so there he could we could we could um i guess assess maybe that he knew it was 15 years if he had done one 15 years prior at 15 year bonding i i don't know what people know i know what we did and i i don't know that we we would have done estimates 15 years ago that would have shown 15 year estimates um, they worked through an engineering firm. He had a partner. I'm not, I cannot say who understood what, when, but partner has now passed away. And this is the first one we've done with him since then. And so uh, when we started having conversations with Mr. Kelly, you know, a year and a half ago about what he wanted to do, I don't think we talked about the fact that it was 15 because I think we thought he knew that. He says he did not know that. How do we not have those conversations when this is such a big part of development? I mean, I guess that's just kind of a, I don't expect you to answer that, but I would think if we're, if we're going to be having these conversations and we want to develop our communities and we want to, I mean, I would think that that would be an integral part of starting the discussion. I mean, can, how can we ensure that that's going to happen? Because for me, I, I want to make sure that if we're going to change something, are we changing it for this one and then we're going to keep it back at 15 or are we moving it to, fit to 20 for every single development? The, the request is to, his request is to allow it on this one. The staff, so as public this works, one only. only. We're, we're neutral on it. It's just a, it's a financial decision. It's a policy decision that's kind of beyond us. Uh, and I think I can say it's just this one because we know we're also working this amendment to the subdivision regulations that would further codify the fact that it's 15 by directing you straight over to our bond policy. So he's asking for a special exception for this one development. All yes. other developments in the future, we would notify developers at the forefront that it would be only 15-year bonding. Yes, but to be clear, 
its policy, the statutes allow 20, any developer could come and ask for the same thing at any time. They just have not ever done it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Don, do you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. more more of a comment. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Public Works staff for working on this, and Commissioner Dennis, I know you've been working on this a long time. And recall, um, if I recall correctly, we did talk about this in a staff meeting, correct? Yes. About this particular project. I mean, it's been a number of months ago, but we talked about how a developer could potentially use 20 years because, but for this 20-year plan, he, the developer wasn't going to do it. Is that correct, Commissioner Dennis? Okay. I mean, th that's just what I remember because we, we specifically were looking at ways to get this development. So um, I commend Commissioner Dennis for uh, um, obviously promoting his district but also getting new housing development in West Sedgwick County um, uh, within county limits. That's It's a great thing for our community and it's a good thing for the county coffers long term. So thank you. Thank you, Jim. And of course, uh, Commissioner Dennis, uh, your district should be proud. I have a, okay, before we vote, I have a question. So when, uh, when, does, when does the phase two financing start? It's after the developer says, okay, I'm far enough along, I want to start phase two, or is, is phase one and two financed and bonded right off the bat? So the trigger is, um, both of these could potentially lay dormant for some time. We know that he wants to do phase one and get started. Has been had an engineer working on the plans, but the actual trigger is, uh, we talked a little bit about this uh, special assessment policy, and we won't start anything until he shows up with a letter of credit for 35% of the project uh, cost. And so that's when he says, he puts his money on the table and says, we're ready to go. We won't hire an engineer. We won't let a project, we won't do anything. Um, I want to say he's ready to do the letter of credit on phase one right now. Um, typically, a couple years down the road, depending on how the marketing goes, when he's used up enough lots in this phase and he thinks he needs to be a year ahead of time to get them, then we'll, we'll hear from him again, we'll see the letter of credit, we'll hire an engineer to do the plans, and we'll get started on phase two. There's typically several years lag between them. So, and... So if, if this development, there's been a few developments out in the outlying areas, not in the county, but some other communities that have had, that were not completed and the municipality had to take over the payment, the bond payment. If this one's not completed, is this backed by the full faith and credit of Cedric County? Do we have to pay for it? Yes. Okay. But again, the letter of credit, and I think historically what we found is if a subdivision got 35% in and going, it sort of becomes a functioning live thing and they right. go on to completion. Right. Uh, I can remember when we didn't have letters of credit and people would do this whole 80 acres all at one time because we would do it. And then they would get two houses in there and go go down. And then and we, we actually had the problem you're referring to, you know, 30 years ago. But we... You'd that policy was changed to get a 35%. Get the letter of credit. 35% of phase one. Yes. So he would not be able to do phase two until? He shows up with another another letter of credit. Okay. And they could be overlapping, simultaneous, or one could, typically they want to get one off the books before they want to add one because it does impact their their personal financing. And, and is there a financial vetting that goes on with the developer? If a developer approaches us, is there any financial uh, vetting? So I would speak? say no. It would okay. be, can you get the letter of credit? And I think that's not that easy. <coughs> right. What they keep telling me, it's not easy. So, Well, for I know, you have to put up 35% of the yeah. money in a bank. And then yeah. they give you a letter of credit for the money you put in the bank. <laughs> but uh, yes. I, it, it, it puzzles me a little bit that, that we even have to, to make this decision. It's... Uh, if I take all 54 lots and see the money, the difference between 15 and 20, it's about, if I do quick math on $45 a lot, it's like $2,430. He's talking about a million dollar project. And I mean, I, I get it, but, but it, it just, I'm just, I guess when he, I guess he's challenged to show up a 35% letter of credit and then the exposure on the first phase would be what the county would be at risk. Right. 
or if, or if he would choose to just go with 15 year, it cost him $2,500 more a month. I don't, I don't know Mr. this developer at all, so. Um, okay, any other comments? Okay, being none, Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. Chairman Meissner? Aye. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Item F, Report of the Board of Bids and Contracts Regular Meeting on May 28, 2020. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Joe Thomas, Purchasing Director. Hi, Joe. Welcome. Uh, the meeting of the Board of Bids and Contracts, we've reinstated that, and on May 28th we had a meeting, and we have two items that we'd like to present to you today. Our first item is the backup hardware and software-related products for the Division of Information and Technology. This recommendation is to accept the or utilize the State of Minnesota Value Point Master Agreement, which is part of the State of Kansas Participating Contract 40403, 40403C, F, and G. And this is good through July 31st of 2021. Our final item is the SAP Business by Design for Enterprise Resource Planning. Uh, this recommendation is to accept the quote from SAP Public Services, and this is in the amount of $2,550,415.20. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you may have, and I recommend approval of both items. Any questions to Joe? We oh. not vote to approve boards and bids and contracts. Second. Motion and a second to approve the, the bids as presented. Uh, being no questions, further questions, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Dennis. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner Cruz. Aye. Chairman Meitzner. Aye. Thank you, Commissioners. Next item, please, Madam Clerk. Consent agenda. Good morning, again. <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioners. Tom Stoles, County Manager, recommending approval of consent items G through N, with the exception of H and I, which uh, there's a technical problem with that contract. We're going to have to bring that back next week. So G through N, with exception of A through A and I. Okay. Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I move that we uh, approve the consent items except for H and I, but I did... And Jim Weber's gone, but um, item G is the bridge we were talking about the other day, which uh, David Spears and staff were able to apply for. Oh, you're here. So I, I was just going to brag on you guys because this is, from what I understand, this is the hydraulic bridge we got the million dollar federal grant award from, or for, sorry, not from. Um, and so it's only going to be costing the county about $300,000 um, out of the what would have cost us because it's the lowest uh, performing bridge in the county. Um, what, what's the, do you know what the marking is on that bridge, like what we have it rated at? It's extremely low. Uh, we had to take it down to three tons. It's as low as you can go but if you have to close it. <laughs> right, so that's how bad it is. And public works staff really needs commended for applying for that grant, receiving that grant, because it, it needed to happen anyway, but, but it stayed in the Sedgwick County taxpayers a million dollars. So, so that, that this is, it's great. So just please pass that along to all the staff that were involved in it. And the citizens of District 2 that travel South Hydraulic are going to be very grateful that we have a, a bridge that, that is truly in, in dire need of replacement and the worst bridge in the county. So yep. it's good for everybody. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Weber. Okay, motion and a second for consent agenda items G through N with the exception of H and I. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Who was the second? Oh. Second. Okay. A motion and a second. Please call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. Chairman Meitzner? Next item, please. Legislative issues. Uh, yes, Mr. Papoon. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I'm Mike Papoon, County Counselor. Uh, as normal, I've been on the phone with our county lobbyist, uh, Jason Watkins, to see what anything that he is aware of going on in Topeka. It's been a wild legislative session. Um, about an hour and 15 minutes ago, uh, Governor Kelly's special legislative session began, 
and they're up in Topeka right now looking at um, some of the legislation that got vetoed in the in the previous regular session, including the COVID bill that was 78 pages long and resulted in a special meeting that we had last week because it, it somewhat limited the governor's executive authority, and that's why the Ad Astra plan uh, was no longer enforceable on the state level. But some of the things that are going on in Topeka this week, uh, yeah, she vetoed the COVID bill last week. This week she vetoed a number of other bills as well, uh, which affected Cedric County. One was the formerly Senate Bill 294, which involved, it was also known as the Truth in Taxation, which would have required us to adopt a resolution every time we raised our, our levy rate, would have, been, would have required a number of th other things, notice requirements on the part of the county clerk. That was vetoed. The bill that would have allowed taxpayers to pay their second half property tax payments late uh, into August without penalty, uh, that was also part of the bill that was vetoed. Um, you know, they're going to be up looking at some of her executive uh, authority again. Uh, she she needs that. She's talked about working with the legislature, some kind of a cooperative effort to, to work together uh, with some oversight of her authority, uh, and that's going to be needed for a number of, of areas, I believe, on the state level for funding and other otherwise and we're going to be we'll learn more of that in the next few days um, that's it's been a, been a wild session we there were a number a couple of pieces of legislation that we felt uh, would benefit Sedgwick <coughs> County that made it through the Senate and then fell by the wayside but there were a number of pieces of legislation that we weren't as favorable to that looked like it was going to pass that also either got vetoed or didn't make it through the session because of the pandemic, but I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Commissioner Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, appreciate the update. I've been following some of these bills pretty closely this entire session, and I'm, uh, I just want to share my personal fe feelings about a couple of these. I'm, I'm extremely disappointed in uh, two of these vetoes. One of them deals with foster care, and uh, what surprises me on this is uh, I think our state has a, a foster care crisis. We have got enormous challenges in our state with, when it comes to foster care. And these, uh, these children, as they age out of the foster care system, this bill would have allowed them to have uh, essentially guaranteed access to college. And I would say break the chain. Um, it would have provided tuition payments for them and helped them get a career started and it was bipartisan. This bill passed the House 110 to, th to 3. I think that's the right number. And then 36 to 3 in the Senate. And um, there's not very many bills that have that huge bipartisan support. And the, re and the reasons that she said that the governor said that she vetoed this was because of a budget shortfall. But I, I would tell you that you, you have to invest in these kids on the front end, and it will save in dividends down the road. This is not a, uh, to me, this is kind of like the Judge Riddell Boys, Boys Ranch issue from years ago. We've got to get these kids on a better path, and I am so disappointed. I, I would love to see uh, the commission take some, pos some positions on supporting foster care solutions in our state. I think we've been silent too long, and I would love to, to lead that. If there's anything I can do to, to, to lend our support to foster care solutions in our state, I would love to do that. But the other bill... Uh, as uh, Mr. Papoon, you've already mentioned this, but I, I actually went to Topeka twice and testified in favor of Senate Bill 294 this last session, and I was convinced it would pass, and in fact, it did pass. Um, it, w it would be law right now if it wasn't for the fact that this bill um, actually made it to the governor's desk after Signy die. Uh, let me give you the numbers. It passed the, that the it passed the House 89 to 28. And again, by, very bipartisan, um, 76 Republicans, 13 Democrats voted for it, and five Republicans voted against it, um, but 80, 89 to 28, that's, that, that's veto-proof in Topeka. So had, they, had this not been done after Sonny Die, it would have been probably overridden. And what this bill does, it provides property tax, property tax transparency 
I know we all say we stand for transparency, um, but this bill would have made sure that our our taxpayers across our our community would have, would would have absolute absolute knowledge of exactly what's happening to their property taxes. One of my frustrations continues to be when the, people get their property tax bill, it's a it's a single. Primarily, people look at the number at the bottom of the page. They don't understand exactly how many taxing jurisdictions are, are levying those taxes. But this would require every taxing jurisdiction, if they're going to increase tax dollar collection, that they would notify those taxpayers and give them a chance to respond before they adopt those budgets. And I, when Karen Tyson, Senator Tyson, talked about this in Topeka, she said, I, I don't know of any taxpayer who wouldn't, we, would not be willing to spend a little bit of their own tax money to be notified exactly what's going on in their own government with respect to property tax increases. And I, I think she's absolutely right when she said that. Um, the other thing that's in this bill that I think that uh, became obvious during the during the session was this bill actually repeals the tax lid, which munis municipalities across this entire state have, have clamored for repeal of the tax lid since it was passed in 2015. And this bill did that. It actually empowers governments to to govern their communities just do it trans with transparency. And uh, so I would tell you that I, I expect this bill will come back next year. Um, I would like to see our commission take a position on this on this uh, policy uh, policy bill um, next year. But there's other, actually there's one other thing we've, we've talked about as commission that uh, didn't get, uh, we didn't get total agreement here, but we did talk about it at length. And that is the the affirmment of, of, of the second half of 2019 tax bill, a property tax bill, until later in the year and a, and a waiving of interest on that tax bill. I know that was controversial, but the state passed it, and they do have the authority. So there would be no question that this is legal. And there was some question about what impact that would have on local governments. I'm glad, I'm glad to report, and I hope this is interesting to everyone, but I was curious this morning, what is our tax property, t property tax collection rate um, compared to last year because of COVID-19, how is it going? Our tax, again, bear in mind, we're levying more tax dollars this year because we had an increase in property taxes and our budget for for the current year. But the tax collection, the, the, the delinquency rate is only down one half of 1% compared to last year. So we're getting the tax dollars into Sedgwick County uh, treasurer's office and she's able to distribute those funds as normal. So there's not much impact in terms of property tax collection, but that was one of the reasons that was state cited by the governor for vetoing this bill. And so I guess I just want to say I'm very disappointed that we've, we've put so much work into this and we have now uh, gone backwards. And so I, I think we need to make sure this gets on our platform next year. We need to engage and support transparency next year. Hopefully this policy bill will be, re will be restarted. So with that, Mr. Chairman, that's all my comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments? Okay, being none, Madam Clerk, next item. Other? Oh, does anybody have anything under other? Um, Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to thank our sheriff and our police chief and uh, all the um, men and women in uniform for uh, everything they've been doing this week. Uh, we've been following it a lot, and uh, I think Sedgwick County is blessed with exceptional law enforcement, and uh, including former law enforcement people like, like our county manager, who's a decent guy, I guess. So, uh, but uh, anyway, um, I think we're just super blessed with uh, Chief Ramsey and uh, Sheriff Easter, and I just wanted to go on record saying that. Okay. Commissioner Cruz. Thank you. Um, you know, I, as an elected official who represents um, this community, I, I really want to recognize the importance of the protests that are going on throughout our country and our community. The message is clear, uh, Black Lives Matter, and it's time for a change that reflects that. Justice is long overdue. We are fortunate, though, here in our community to have Wichita Police Department, our Sedgwick County officers, um, who want to listen, learn, and are willing to work together with those impacted to find solutions. Our community is very weak right now. We are fighting a pandemic. Many local businesses are struggling, 
and now in the very fabric of our community is being ravaged by protests that have become violent. I don't know that we'll withstand the damage if it lasts much longer. I really want every person in this community to know that I want to work to find solutions. I want to engage with those who are actively um, participating in every facet of our community to come together to lead with action. I'm, I, I'm, I'm nervous um, to even make this statement because some people might take it out of context that I don't support what's going on, but that is not the case. I, I am not a black American. I cannot um, begin to um, understand what black Americans go through on a daily basis, but I believe you and I want you to know that I'm here to find solutions. My hope is that our community can heal from this and we can work together to act in ways that will find things that will fix this long overdue problem. So please, over the next few days, I'm hoping to organize um, a conversation with community leaders, with um, um, activists, with our, our police chief, with our sheriff, um, with commissioners, with council members, um, with anybody who wants to have a voice to talk about what we can do to come together. That's, that's my hope. I hope that you guys understand that I'm here to listen. Um, I'm using my voice right now to express exactly um, that. I, I want to listen, I want to hear what you have to say, and I want to work with you to find a solution to fix this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Any other uh, comments under other? Okay, being none. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Executive session. You have a 15 minute one? Yeah. Okay. Do we need 15 or 10? I think we need 10. We can. 10. And 10. 10. Commissioner Cruz is there, but yeah, I think 10 minutes would probably be. Better. I think so too. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I move that the Board of County Commissioners recess into executive session for 10 minutes until 11. 40 um, for consultation with an attorney for the county regarding matters deemed privilege in the attorney client relationship in order to discuss <coughs> pending litigation and that the Board of County Commissioners returns to this room from executive session at 10 uh, 1140 excuse me I'll second that there's been a motion and a second Madam Clerk call the roll Commissioner O'Donnell Aye. Commissioner Dennis Aye. Commissioner Howell Aye. Commissioner Cruz Aye. Chairman Meitzner and uh, I understand we will stay here in this office, so we will take a second for the uh, to mute the microphones and the cameras, please. Here.
seven, six, five. Go. Okay, well, the commission has returned from executive session. No formal action was taken. Mr. Papoon? Uh, yeah, at this point, we'll be ready for a motion, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I move that we settle the pending lawsuit, Spencer Lindsay versus Wagoner and Sedgwick County for the sum of $35,000, subject to a full release by plaintiff. Second. There's been a motion and a second. Any other comments? Being none, Madam Clerk, call roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. Chairman Meitzner? Aye. Okay, Madam Clerk, next item, <clears throat> we go to another, do you have something? No, we have another executive session. Okay, I, Cruz. Thank you, Chairman. I move that the Board of County Commissioners recess <clears throat> into executive session for 20 minutes until 12 o'clock um, to discuss matters relating to security measures for the purpose of discussing the security of the Board of County Commissioners, County Employees, Sedgwick County Buildings, and other county facilities, and that the Board of County Commissioners um, return to a live session from executive session at 12 o'clock. Second. We've done a motion and second to go into another executive session. Any comments? Being none, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Commissioner O'Donnell? Aye. Commissioner Dennis? Aye. Commissioner Hell? Aye. Commissioner Cruz? Aye. Chairman Meitzner? Aye. We will go to executive session as soon as the microphones and the cameras are off.
happy. Give you a thumbs up. You say okay? Okay. We have returned from executive session. Uh, no formal action was taken. And if there's any other comments, I don't see any. Uh, we will adjourn today's meeting. Everybody be safe.